test test. This is the Charter Revision Commission hearing. Uh, today's date is March 25th, 2019. This recording is being recorded by Honda Utai. Good evening and welcome to tonight's public meeting of the 2019 New York City Charter Revision Commission. I'm Gail Benjamin, the chair of the commission, and I am joined by the following commission members. Um, the Honorable Sal Albanese, the Honorable Jim Karras, the Honorable Lisette Camillo, the Honorable Eduardo Cordero, the Honorable Paula Gavin, the Honorable Allison Hirsch, the Honorable Satish Nuri, and the Honorable Dr. Merrill Tisch. With those members, ah, and the Honorable Lillian Paoli. With those members present, we have a quorum. Normally, we would do a vote now and adopt the minutes. I'm going to move that to the end because I understand we have some severe time limitations from some of the panelists. Um, today is the conclusion of our series of expert forums on the focus areas we adopted in January. Um, I had a whole bunch of stuff to say, but I'm going to just move right to the panel so that we can have the most amount of time with you. And the first speaker to speak about the role of our presidents is um, the Honorable Ruth Messenger. Thank you very, very much, Madam Chair, members of the Commission. It's exciting to be here, a little strange to be back in this room. Um, I'm going to try to keep my own remarks um, brief, and I thank you for your time adjustment, but I'm teaching in Harlem at 7.15, so I have my eye on the clock. Um, I'm not going to present a lengthy treatise either orally or in writing, but I'm simply speaking to the importance of continuing to have elected borough presidents with clear authority to work on borough-wide issues and with sufficient office budgets to make it possible for them to do this work. The borough president position, I think you really know all of this, but draws its strength precisely from being less narrowly focused, less parochial than individual council representatives. It offers a very large and very diverse city, a level of government intermediate between local districts, both city and state, and the citywide government. There are many issues that ought to be brought to city government on behalf of the council members and sometimes on behalf of the council members and the community board chairs together. A borough president should regularly convene these two groups and urge the members to determine additional and specific budget and land use issues that are important to the borough and then hammer out a borough position rather than letting the mayor and or any commissioner make proposals that set one council district or member against another. Similarly, the mayor and or commissioners should bring issues to the borough president and ask for a coordinated borough position on the matter. I note that some of this happens already. I did some of this, so did borough president Fields, but I think more of it should happen and I think more of it can be encouraged structurally by the changes that you choose to make in the charter. And I would note in that regard that I am in accordance with the much more detailed line-by-line -line submission made to you by the current Manhattan Borough President. I just want to cite some quick examples from the headlines showing about to demonstrate the power of doing things this way. The question of where and how to design a borough jail. The question of the best way to achieve improved school integration. 
the parameters of which site to offer for additional affordable housing, of where to sacrifice open space, could all benefit from additional borough-based discussion and borough-based or borough board negotiations handled by the borough president. The challenge, for one more point, for protecting small businesses, an area where the current Manhattan borough president has been very involved, is just one more example of work that benefits from being studied throughout a borough. Sorry. <laughs> Effort to keep time. Um, I want to say that during my borough presidency, I think one of the strongest things that happened was the development of a very sophisticated and knowledgeable land use unit which was able to review and comment on land use proposals that were eventually going to go before the council. We were able to influence the council's consideration because we could bring expertise that was much more difficult for an individual council member or community board to develop. We could and did provide data and analyses that the involved council member could then use in her or his negotiations with the developer or in advancing her or his position. Similarly, our land use unit was available to and used by several community boards in developing what the Charter refers to as 197A plans, where communities can be engaged in plotting out some aspects of their own future development, indicating where they want to see growth, where they want to see open space, how they envision changes in traffic patterns, and what zoning they would recommend. That worked. I think it's something that could be mandated and required for community boards on a rotating basis to develop those individual independent plans before they get hit with requests from developers. I want to make two more very quick comments. One is that the existence of borough presidents does also provide the public with people that they can consider for citywide offices based on how those individuals have been performed in their boroughs. That is a more logical step forward than imagining and guessing which individual district office holders could best handle the challenge of citywide positions. One additional point outside the scope of the borough presidency, when I was in government, and actually when I was on the city council, it's a million years ago, we required the city to prepare and publish a tax expenditure budget. I believe this provision still exists, but I know that on several occasions during my tenure and subsequently, the report was not published until we asked for it. Given the recent articles about tax forgiveness negotiations around both Amazon and Hudson Yards, it would be of interest for this commission to investigate the status of this requirement, ensure that it is mandated, and see to it that the document is released annually with the proposed executive budget. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Fields? Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the commission, and I thank you for the opportunity to speak before this commission. I want to applaud you for your time and commitment in engaging in this critically important process. And giving thought to the Commission's charge as it relates to ways to expand and enhance the role of borough presidents, and having had the opportunity to read the presentation of borough president uh, Brewer and Otto, I wish to support the views and the recommendations made by borough president Brewer with respect to land use matters. Given the fact that a number of changes related to zoning and development have taken place over the last 13 years since I occupied that position, and without more in-depth study of the changes and impact, I defer to the current borough president, uh, Brewer, who covered the land use issues in great details. One point to make is, on the matter of ULERT, that borough president votes should be changed to binding. On the community board level, another major role and responsibility of borough presidents, I support uh, borough president uh, Brewer's comments in relation to term limits of members. Longtime board members through institutional knowledge and awareness can build up the expertise that enable them to navigate and negotiate effectively in the interests of their communities. But in relation to governance overall, just as the mayor, as executive officer of the city under the city charter, is required to communicate to the council at least once in each year a statement of our finances, government, and affairs of the city, etc., and to meet 
I propose a formalized, institutionalized procedure that requires borough presidents not only to submit a written statement to the mayor, as it is generally called for, typically it doesn't always work that way, <laughs> and the council, as well as an annual face-to-face -face meeting that would expand, enhance, and add immeasurable value to the three offices working in a more constructive way on behalf of the city. This could provide the wealth of information and knowledge of borough presidents from the perspective of borough presidents to discuss budgets, land use issues, or other matters that impact residents of the respective boroughs. Pretty much along the line that uh, our former borough president, Ruth Messenger, actually talked about. Most assuredly, the time period should be tied into the budget. And as the mayor develops the budget meetings with borough presidents, this would be required to gather their input based on the needs of their borough. Presently, such meetings with the mayor on such matters is directly built on relationships, mostly along party lines. As a charter uh, requirement, this would be done in the interest of New Yorkers and not on the basis of political parties as to whether a mayor likes or dislikes a borough president. This also creates a working relationship with the mayor, borough president, and council that I think, again, would be uh, at immeasurable value. So in my written testimony, which I will present to the committee, and tonight this is just the oral one, I will expand further on this brief statement as to why I think this is important for consideration as well as speak to the need for stronger involvement in redistricting process as well as increased discretionary budgets. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Capelli. Thank you. That's great. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Alan Capelli. Let me begin by thanking the Charter Revision Commission 2019 for inviting me to join on the topic of examining the borough, Office of Borough President. Let me specifically acknowledge the honor it is to be on the panel with two distinguished former borough presidents, some of my favorite office holders and people who I have a great deal of respect for, uh, their commitment to uh, social justice as well as their expertise in handling the office. They also both navigated their jobs having to deal with delegations from Manhattan which are often a very diverse group of people, strong and independent, and I would often say that uh, was a lot like herding cats uh, as they were trying to develop uh, uh, relationships uh, and, and deal with policies that affected the borough. So uh, the fact that each of them was very successful is a testament to the skills that they have, not necessarily to charter uh, infused power. Uh, I'm a native New Yorker. I've been in public service for f almost 40 years, and I actually started my tenure uh, as a, an employee of the Manhattan Borough President's Office. Uh, uh, years later, I went to work, uh, many, many years later, I went to work in the Bronx Borough President's Office, working for then Borough President Fernando Ferrer. Uh, I have served uh, Governor Mario Cuomo uh, for his entire uh, tenure. He appointed me as chairman of the Unemployment Insurance Appeals Board. I was uh, an, uh, an advocate for the riders as a member of the MTA board for eight years. Uh, I served uh, several years on the Civil Service Commission uh, of the City of New York and recently left that to join the City Planning Commission. Uh, additionally, I'm currently serving as uh, a member of the Real Estate Tax Advisory Commission of both the Council and the, uh, uh, the Office of the Mayor. I offer that is varied experience dealing with public office holders in the conduct of, of the city. I was also a member of the, uh, I started out as a member of the planning board. Uh, I agree with much of what my uh, colleagues on this panel uh, have had to say, and I, I, especially with respect to my personal respect for uh, Borough President uh, Gail Brewer. What I think, uh, with the city incorporated its various parts, uh, they created a, uh, a dynamic that the boroughs were going to have representation of their own. And as everybody in here is aware, when the uh, uh, court struck down the Board of Estimate, which was the ruling body, then the city was f forced to come up with something for the borough presidents to do. 
comply with uh, uh, one person, one vote standards, which in fact empowered the council. The, uh, they created a strong mayoralty to go with the enhanced powers of the, of the power, and they gave a hodgepodge of things to the borough president, failing to recognize that the borough president is in a unique position, as council member of Messenger said, to really advocate for the borough and, and keep a focus on it where often district council members don't have the ability to do that. Uh, you know, at one time there was a concept, and I think it works to some extent, of district service cabinet uh, meetings or borough service cabinet meetings, whereby the services in the, the uh, borough are coordinated amongst the lead agency officials in the borough. Uh, I think the Charter Commission ought to consider uh, uh, strengthening that role. I think consideration ought to be given to more appointments being given to the uh, borough presidents. Uh, you could comply with the Voting Rights Act by uh, making uh, certain appointments you know, subject to the uh, recommendation of the borough president. So you could have a borough parks commissioner that comes from the, uh, uh, the uh, recommendation of the borough president. You could have a, a borough traffic uh, transportation commissioner and so on and so forth. Issues that are required to have coordination on a local level that sometimes get lost uh, if you don't have somebody with the borough-wide concerns on top of it. I, I know both Borough President Otto and Borough President Brewer are two borough presidents who are very much on top of it, but it, there ought to be enhanced power for them to be able to uh, manage the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the functions of service delivery uh, for the borough. Uh, and, and it's not just in the delivery of resource, it's often the coordination amongst agencies who, quite frankly, it, it amazes me when I, when I talk to various agencies, they, they don't talk to one another uh, on projects and things just get left out. And so the borough president is uniquely qualified to manage uh, the uh, service delivery operations uh, for, uh, for, the, for their respective boroughs. Uh, I will uh, stop talking now so that uh, we can get into some questions. I know my colleagues have to run, and then I'll, I'll jump back in uh, uh, after that. Thank okay. You. I would just like to recognize first that Reverend Miller, seated on my left, has joined us, as has uh, Chair Weisbrod. I'm not quite sure where he's seated. And um, the Honorable Steve Fiella has joined us. Um, the first question is from the Honorable Fi Steve Fiella. What? I thought you were first, but Sal is second on my list. Thank you so much. Um, I've been looking forward to this panel very much. I mean, we, we've got some real experts uh, the issue that has uh, consumed many of us from the outer borough since the inception of the existing charter that we're operating under has been a borough voice. We have two borough presidents here, and Mr. Capelli, you have experience across the board, so I'd love to hear from all three of you. Does the existing charter, it seems to me the way to frame the question with respect to borough empowerment and a meaningful uh, role for that borough voice, the, the way to frame the question is to ask it very simply. Does the existing language in the current charter meet the expectations of that meaningful voice? And I'd be particularly interested in hearing about your thoughts with respect to budget. For example, the charter empowers the borough president to make recommendations. But it's been argued over the last 30 years that the charter doesn't sufficiently provide a meaningful mechanism for enforcing at least a response of uh, respect from the, the other players. So I view the charter as kind of missing a few dots. If we're connecting the dots, we don't have the whole picture that we need. And I'd be really curious to hear from all of you with respect to that. Uh, Commissioner, I absolutely agree with you. I think what I was trying to say is that the charter as written makes possible most of the things that I talked to that Borough President Fields mentioned, but it doesn't mandate enough of them. Or, as you described, 
It allows them to happen, but there's no requirement for a response. Now, that's not a meaningful communication in the structure of city government. And so saying when a borough president makes an opinion on a land use issue or makes, to take your example, specific recommendations for the use of the city budget in her or his borough, there ought to be a requirement for an informed response, not just thank you very much. And some of that, it seems pretty clear to me, has to be mandated. I do want to note, since Mr. Capelli talked about the when the role of the borough president changed, I just want to note for history's sake that I was actually involved working with many people in imagining a new charter back then in the early 80s when I was on the city council. I knew I was about to run for Manhattan borough president. I nevertheless thought this was the only way to comply with the requirement of the Supreme Court and that what was needed was to beef up the very specific aspects of what a borough president could do. And I feel like we had fun, we had, a, we, had a, we had a room to play with, and we did a lot of great things, and occasionally we were dispositive. But we would have had much more effectiveness and much more power, even if the mayor was required to respond in a formal fashion to the requests from the Staten Island um, borough president about the budget or whatever. And I don't think it comes as a surprise that uh, borough president Messenger and I agree on uh, this issue especially. And I think that's why I kind of centered my uh, comments with respect to uh, institutionalize, formalizing, or strengthenizing, strengthenizing, strengthening the process in the charter to make it very clear that it's not just something nice to do to have a borough president make a statement which nobody perhaps would even read or to say, okay, they're over there, but this is where the real game is being played since the last charter revision really did strengthen the hand of the mayor and the council, of course, the borough presidents have land use. But borough presidents know so much more. Borough presidents do so much more. And their sense and the needs of a borough right now, there's really nowhere to put it where it helps to inform budgets, land use decisions before we get so caught up sometime in things that just become battles. So I think the language should be strengthened, and that's an area by which I think, uh, at which rather, I think that more attention needs to be given. How can we have it written into the charter that mandates that these statements and these face-to-face -face meetings, because in the charter it does state that the mayor has to meet with the council in addition to giving them the written statements. And as I also pointed out, the way it's written now, it really leaves it up to the whims or the likes or the dislikes of a mayor. And we've seen that, and we've gone through that. I certainly went through it with Mayor Rudolph Giuliani. I probably had maybe two meetings with him or whatever, but it was not around the substantive things that were going on in Manhattan that we knew about, we were working on, and we believe could have been very helpful in making some of the ultimate budget decisions. And you can have some reasonable you know, disagreements but that needs to be mandated. And it also gives the borough presidents, I think, much more clout in their own borough because they're not feeling they're out there just working in nowhere to house everything that they know and everything that they do. So that's an area that I think we really have to give a much more uh, focus and concentration to. Mr. Capelli, did you want to respond? Well, I would, I would, my answer would be no. The current charter doesn't. Uh, give borough presidents the kind of uh, clear authority that they can and should have. Uh, the uh, uh, is a lot of, as mentioned, a lot of vague language and you know, can, or shall, or whatnot. They're executive. They're part of the executive branch of the city, and they should uh, have some real uh, power in the executive branch of the city. They're not part of the legislature. Uh, they can, you know, as I said, if, you know, the control uh, or having an effect, uh, the control is probably a bad word, but having an effect on who is going to help manage 
uh, the, you know, the functions of city agencies and the delivery of services is something that clearly could be given to borough presidents uh, b by making uh, the appointment subject uh, um, a recommendation by the borough president like it is with city planning and l landmarks and, and other things for them to be a borough commissioner uh, or uh, a sort. Uh, a sort. And uh, you know, increase their ability to control the on-ground. Uh, just you know, I mean, uh, the Staten Island Borough President, like the Manhattan Borough President currently, he's sitting down. He's he's looking at traffic patterns. You know, he's trying to get uh, DOT to cooperate with uh, 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 you know uh, various other agencies, including uh, the, the uh, e, uh, DEP and others. And he doesn't really have the juice to be able to make that happen under the current system, and he should. Thank you very much. Sal, and then Jim. All right, good evening. It's great to see two of my favorite ex-colleagues uh, here in the chamber. We spent a lot of time together here many years ago. Uh, my question is, uh, if, if you had the option of selecting one additional power for the borough president's office, uh, that would be beneficial to the office and the people in the borough, what would it be? Well, I guess for me, it would be what I've said up to this point in terms of uh, the power to help uh, influence decisions around the budget through uh, different means of communication and mandated communication and working as a part of a team with the mayor and the city council because of what I believe borough presidents can bring to that uh, process. So establish a formal process. That for would fall under that, establishing, writing into the charter a more formalized process by which this should happen. Not maybe could, if I like you, I will, if I don't, I won't. You know, that kind of stuff. No, be very specific that um, there shall be a written statement from the borough president to uh, the mayor and the city council on the variety of issues that we talk about, the budget, land use, and other matters, and an annual meeting specifically around the budget time so that the views and the information and the awareness that borough presidents have can hopefully help shape the preliminary as well as the final budgets. But they don't do that now. So that's an area I would highlight. So um, I'm going to try to get in two or three points since you know I have to leave. First of all, I want to, uh, Madam Chair, I want to just thank Indiana for her fantastic staffing of this um, process. It's really been extremely helpful, including all the information she sent out. Second of all, Sal, while I want to really want to sort of align with what Borough President Field said, if you pushed me to do one thing, it would be to mandate the strengthening of the land use staffing in the borough president's office and mandate how that staff needed to be used. Because with all due respect, anybody, right now, there's a huge leeway. It's not just the leeway for the mayor to ignore the borough presidents, which we are in agreement with, but also for the borough president to do what she or he wants with a unit. I think that there should be a man, I don't know how you specify it in size, but the land use unit that has a specific requirement to review and inform on major Euler projects and on what I spoke to specifically, which is making in some system, which you'd have to sort of design, making that land use unit available to individual community boards in the borough to do their own proactive planning. Um, all, every issue in this city is about land use, and almost all of it is initiated the way it has been for years, largely by the builder community, and so the, all of the people in government have been reacting. And we've all seen, for a variety of reasons, legitimate and illegitimate, that the first response of a community board, of a community board chair, of a council member, of state led is not in my district. And that's not just for a homeless shelter. It's for too much height. It's for virtually anything. If, though, in some rotating basis, you could go neighborhood by neighborhood and say, you know, you have the use of this land use planning staff, I think that the Charter 127A <coughs> spells a lot of this out, but is to do a plan for the district, and maybe something that every district gets to review a plan, do a plan once every 10 years, 
then it puts some onus on the builder community to be responsive to that, and it could eliminate some of the, we just seem to enjoy these battles endlessly and forever. I want to give one example. You may all not agree with what happened, but when I was borough president and David Dinkins was mayor, and David Dinkins was, as you all know, a great friend of mine, there was a proposal for the development of what is now the Audubon um, Biotech up, up at 168th Street. And I had two objections to, just as an example, I, required, there was, I thought it was really insufficient provision for jobs to go to the community, despite Columbia's great promises, nothing was on paper. And I thought, and I am aware that Commissioner Weisbrod will not say anything, some architectural people did not agree with me that the facade of the ballroom should be kept because of the fame of the Audubon Ballroom. But I promise you that the executive branch, my good friend Mayor David Dingus, was against the two things I proposed. And we're absolutely certain that they had to take advantage of this offer from Columbia without tying any additional strings. And for reasons that exist in the most bizarre arcania of New York City government, they happen to be funding this project with Port Authority bonds. You can, we can all agree that a biotech station at 165th Street has nothing to do with the Port Authority. But that's how they were funding it. And the requirement for the Port Authority bonding was that the county executive had to sign off. We made the case in court that as borough president, I was the county executive. We won that case in court, and we negotiated an infinitely better agreement and the preservation of the facade, which the distinguished architect Lou Davis sub subsequently agreed was a good idea. But that was just because that was like one area in which I had actual sign-off power. Otherwise, I would have been negotiating, and David would have been saying, you know, I, we had those discussions, like, no, your ideas are good, but we already have an agreement, and we can't add anything. And because I had uh, veto power, we did add things, and it worked. Great example. Oh, I'm okay. sorry. Uh, the one thing would be, well, I w they're related. I would mandate uh, borough board meetings on some kind of a schedule, and I would mandate uh, and create an effective district service cabinet where many of the things that council member, uh, council member, borough president, uh, messenger stated it's could okay. be. She was both. I'm sorry? Yes, she, she was, was both. both. Yes, and I know her through all those years, but. Uh, she was demoted to borough president. That's, well, <laughs> kind of in, in some respects, but uh, the, uh, because you can create the agenda for the borough when, you, when you're dealing with the you, you've got a council delegation, you've got the community board chairs, uh, you can create the uh, budgetary priorities for the borough, uh, and you can work in consensus with those people, but you can only do it if it is a required and a mandated function of the borough president, because otherwise people are just going to blow these meetings off. Thank you. Uh, Jim and then Satish. I want to thank you all for uh, coming today. Uh, it's been great listening to you. I had uh, one question uh, for, well, I'll put this to everyone. Um, the, are there any uh, additional boards or commissions you think the borough president should have appointments to? BSA, uh, Landmarks Preservation Commission, Landmarks, I believe he has. Oh, yeah. no? has, has landmarks. Right at the top, I can't think of any. I'll give that further thought. Landmarks have that. The um, controls. I, certainly the Board of Standards and Appeals. Okay, oh, board because of that's Appeals. the mechanism by which. Yeah, that, city, city planning gets right it, around. It seemed a little odd to me that they would have appointments to the city planning commission, but not to the BSA as well. It's, I agree. Uh, and I want to make sure I was getting right what you said, uh, Mr. Capelli. Uh, you think there should be some process whereby uh, the borough presidents are involved in the selection of borough commissioners? Yes, I think. And do you know what that should look like? Do you have any? I think that the borough president should have the should it should be a requirement that he make a recommendation to the mayor 
The mayor doesn't have to accept it. He may have to submit another name. It's kind of like, but should have input on who is going to run, uh, you know, the uh, Staten Island Department of Transportation, uh, the, uh, you know, the parks, uh, the EPA, or whatnot, so that that person feels that, you know, I mean, the president is part of an executive branch, and he's, a, he's elected by the people. So at she. least... Or she's elected up by the mm. people, in fact. <laughs> what she's been he's these days. And maybe one day we'll get a she for mayor. But uh, uh, the um, uh, absolutely, uh, that I think the real question is what agencies that the, the borough commissioner has real power that shouldn't go through that process. Thank you. I guess uh, just to comment, as I, you know, participate and listen and uh, gave thought to uh, come in here this evening. Overall for me, again, it is that the borough presidents do much more. They have more information. Their interaction at the community levels by way of community boards as well as public hearings that they themselves will hold around a variety of issues dealing with land use. There's like no place to put all of that to impact decisions at the end of the day. And as a result, we get into fierce battles quite often that I think can be uh, eliminated or certainly uh, minimized through uh, strengthening the communication, the mandated roles of borough presidents, and not something like Alan said, I think, when he said when the uh, charter was changed, to come up with something for borough presidents to do. And I think that's what happened. But borough presidents have shown that uh, it is much beyond that. And I think we need to strengthen it now through these changes and make some of these, you know, uh, institutionalize some of this. Thank you. Satish? Good evening. So I work in Brooklyn and I'm sorry, I would live in Brooklyn and I work in Queens and I know that the each of these boroughs has its own unique and distinct characteristics and I think that's true for all the boroughs but as I think about my kids and, and their kids, the idea that people identify with their boroughs I think will will be in question as we move further away from 1898. Um, so if that's true, first, do you think that's true, that people are going to identify with a particular borough of their birth or where they live less and less and more as maybe citizens of New York City as a whole? Is that true? And number two, if that is true, what is the role of the borough president in 50 years, in 75 years, in 100 years? I, sure I can think that for 50 and 100 years, but uh, I think we probably will live with people identifying with their boroughs. How many times I go places and people say, Brooklyn in the house, and everybody shouts, you know, yeah, Brooklyn is in the house, and so forth. So I think that that's just who we are, and we will be associated with our boroughs where we live, uh, but from the perspective of governance, I don't think that that plays so much a role when we talk about a borough president making the input around the needs of that borough, whether it's in education, whether health care, senior issues, because that's what they know. But by making it possible for that input to become part of a broader discussion with the mayor, the city council, <coughs> pardon me, and it could be a cabinet of old presidents doing this, you know, however it gets structured, would at least give some more, I think, oomph, if you will, to how budgets get set. And it, I don't think it will separate people along borough lines in terms of where they live. Well, then I, th I think borough presidents still should wish will still be relevant 50 or 100 years from now, of course, none of us know, and with trends and changes and so forth. But with where we are now, 
and looking into the immediate and long-term 10, 15, 20 years from now, I think the role of borough presidents uh, continue to be important. They should be uh, maintained. And with some of the recommendations being discussed here and other places, I'm sure, will only strengthen that role and, in my opinion, make governance of New York City so much better. Uh, I don't think I agree with your premise. And uh, I've worked in the Bronx, uh, and the Bronxites are very proud and very much identified with the Bronx as being their community. Uh, I worked in Queens when and I was amazed to hear the phrase that they were the forgotten borough, uh, which I always thought was Staten Island. Uh, the, uh, you know, I mean, Brooklyn, Brooklyn's where, where things are happening now and people have strong identity with Brooklyn as being, uh, you know, a thriving, uh, you know, a place. Staten Island, you know, kind of speaks for itself. Uh, Manhattan may be the most, uh, maybe the most, uh, uh, be careful now. No, maybe the, <laughs> maybe the most assimilated in terms of thinking of themselves as being New Yorkers and not Manhattanites. But that doesn't change the premise of somebody focusing on the needs of that particular ge geography. I mean, it's not a, necessarily about identification. It's about who's got their eye on the big picture. And it's not, you know, it's not necessarily, you know, the councilman from, uh, you know, the Lower East Side or Washington Heights or you know, or uh, Chelsea or whatever, it's going to be somebody who's looking at all the neighborhoods and uh, the uh, allocation of, uh, of services and programs and whatnot, who's going to bring a broader perspective to bear. And uh, I think that's, that's the important role uh, that uh, is really uh, uh, something for the borough president uh, to have uh, and will be, it'll be here 50 years from now. And to that point also, I think, and I think it continues, but we had started uh, monthly meetings of all of the five borough presidents where we ourselves would just get together. And we found that there were a number of common issues that we had uh, for which we could support each other on the budget as well as some of the policy issues. And we found that to be helpful because there was not a way for us to interact, say, with the council and the mayors in the way that we're discussing it here tonight. Wait. Um, I actually have a question, and I'm going to take my prerogative as chair so that I can ask my question, and then I understand Jim has a follow-up question, but I am interrupting him. Um, you've talked about the role of the borough president and the unique knowledge they have about the borough, would it be useful, do you think, if there was a formalized role for some type of borough-wide plan that the borough president <coughs> helped to develop every 10 years or so where the borough president working in concert with, I don't know, their community boards, et cetera, looked at areas of growth um, looked at areas where they thought growth could really be sustained, looked at areas that they thought were no longer as useful in the same ways, and came out with their own recommendations for how the development of the borough, both physically um, as well as service-wise. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, uh, having uh, a, a planned uh, and uh, scheduled uh, adoption of a blueprint for the future on a periodic basis, I don't know if it's 10 years, 8 years, I mean, term limits complicate things yes. so much, you know, uh, you know, in this scenario, is extraordinarily useful. Uh, so that, uh, you know, that you, you try to get people uh, in various levels of government, the council and the mayor and other people to understand, you know, the, uh, the desire for, uh, you know, progress for the future. Yes, I would agree. And yes, I would agree. And I was thinking, too, along the lines of eight years would probably kind of be it because of term limits, which gives a new council member as well as the borough president to reassess where we are 
and to, you know, make some changes if necessary based on new information. But at least it's a good starting point because when you get into those offices, it's like, you know, there are a number of things you may very well continue from a previous board president, as I'm sure it is with council members, but you may start totally different. So with that blueprint, it is at least a good starting point that some thought has been given to what the plans for this borough should look like in a number of, covering a number of areas, and you make your own assessments and go from there. So, but eight years, not ten. Well, but don't you, well, I'm gilding the lily there. I think <laughs> that for a plan to be reasonable and effective, it needs to go beyond one person's term it can't just be changed each time there's a new person in that seat, or it's not really a plan. It's i uh, I'm not sure what it's, but I do think that if it happens, it has to be for a long enough period of time that is an accepted community issue that others can count on. So if you have a building cycle and you're a developer and this is the plan and then Virginia Fields is not the borough president, just as you're putting the spade in the ground. It shouldn't be changed. Yeah. And as a leading planner as you are, I am not <laughs> going to quiver with you. <laughs> but <laughs> I would just simply say, Gail, yeah, that no, I don't agree with you. You wouldn't come and disrupt, but you've got to leave space for a person to come in based on new information change, trends, and we have seen that in a number of uh, areas in our boroughs. What was in place happening five years ago, very different now in terms of a number of, you know, people who've come, changes that have been made, uh, rents that have gone so high, forced a lot of the small businesses out, got a very different community. So all I'm saying, there's got to be opportunities. You got the blueprint, but we would have an opportunity to, uh, based on new information. Alan, did, did I see you trying to? I, well, I was going to say that, uh, I mean, I agree with you that uh, change comes slowly, and particularly now that I'm sitting on the City Planning Commission, I see <laughs> things that I was fighting for and advocating when I was on the community board 40 years ago are finally coming to fruition uh, today, uh, or, or hopefully today. So. Uh, you know, there, uh, perhaps there, there should be a long-term and a short-term plan uh, okay. or, uh, you know, something that's, you know, broader, broader in scope for, uh, for, the, uh, for the borough. Okay. Thank you. Jim, did you? Uh, this is more for Mr. Capelli along what he said as just having gone from a community board working for a borough president and now sitting on the city planning commission. Uh, is there, if, if you could say there's one thing, one land use enhancement we could give the borough president, uh, I understand we're probably not going to give the borough president any kind of binding authority, you know, in the Euler process, but what, what would that be in terms of both sort of from the community board roll up through the borough president role? Well, I mean, honestly, I think that, that both the borough president and the city planning commission should have greater ability to uh, negotiate, you know, subject to the council's ultimate approval. But now I think that both are, uh, uh, are shortchanged when they have, in fact, uh, much of the technical expertise. Okay, thank you. Seeing no further questions, I'd like to uh, thank the panel and ask that if, um, and hope, and we're right on schedule, hope that um, if there are additional questions from the members, we can count on you to uh, be in dialogue with us. I know that uh, Borough President Fields has said she would be submitting some written comments. If you would like to submit a written mm -hmm. submission, that would be quite nice. Thank you. And we hope to be in touch with all of you. We thank you for being a part of this, and we'll be in touch.
Um, and we thank you for I'm, your services. I'm, thank I'm you. always available, and my number is everybody in the world has it, so thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, I would like to take a minute right now to entertain a motion to adopt the minutes of the Commission's meeting held on March 21st here at City Hall, a copy of which has been provided to all of the Commissioners. Do I hear a motion? Second? Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? The motion carries. We are now going to start on our second panel to discuss the structure of government and balance of power in general, which, as you know, was a big issue in the 1989 Charter. Uh, we will be joined by Eric Lane, John Molenkopf, and Esther Fuchs, all of whom have experience with past charter revisions. Please go ahead and come up to the dais, introduce yourself, and share any initial comments you may have. As with the prior panels, each person will have approximately three minutes to give an introductory <coughs> speech, and then we'll begin the um, questioning. Professor Molenkoff, you're sitting at the end, so would you like to go first? Uh, when the red light is on, your mic is on. Got it. But you, prop, you need to bring it fairly close in order to be picked up. Good evening, Chairperson Benjamin and distinguished members of the New York City Charter Revisions Commission. My name is John Molenkoff, and I teach and do research on urban politics and policy at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. And it's a pleasure to be here tonight, both with you and my distinguished colleagues, Eric Lane and Esther Fuchs. In my short time, let me uh, address some of the questions you raised in Commission documents and suggest one brand new idea for you to consider. As my CUNY colleague Doug Muzio testified last week, and as Professor Lane will undoubtedly elaborate, your deliberations essentially amount to an assessment of how well the 1989 Charter Revision has fared over the three decades since its enactment. It's a chance to affirm what worked from that pivotal effort and to correct what did not. Its basic, the basic aim of that charter revision was to dismantle the Board of Estimate and to reallocate its powers to the City Council and to the Mayor, thereby substantially reducing the powers of the Borough Presidents. In the main, the 1989 charter reform has worked quite well, and my overall message is don't fix what is not broken. Perhaps the most important challenge of implementing the 1989 Charter was empowering the City Council to be an effective representative and democratic body. As Henry Stern told many of us at that time, the previous Council was worse than a rubber stamp because it did not even leave an impression. Today, it is safe to say that the City Council is full of able members who represent their highly diverse constituencies very well. The second aim of the 1989 Charter Reform was to continue the long march to empowering the mayor and reducing the influence of partial and special interests that often express themselves through the borough presidents on the Board of Estimate. The new charter, is that better? Oh, no, it's not you. There's oh, someone. Sorry. Somewhere. Uh, pardon me. The new charter succeeded in this aim as well, giving us a series of iconic mayors who, whether we like them or not, had the power to respond to the crises of their times and were held accountable for their performance. The 1989 Charter Revision Commission made a halfway compromise on the position of public advocate. My understanding of the thinking within the 1989 Commission and its staff was that they leaned towards abolishing the position of City Council President. The primary reason that they did not do so was a fear that the incumbent, Andrew Stein, would spend a lot of his own money to defeat charter reform. 
In the past 30 years, the primary function of the public advocate position has been to provide a platform for aspiring candidates for higher office to win a citywide election and achieve greater political visibility, generally to the detriment of city council leaders who also sought to be mayor. You can sum up. Okay. You don't have to well, cut it basically, I, I practice this, but obviously not well enough. Uh, what I, what I want to say is that I would not change the powers of the uh, borough presidents or the public advocate. I would not give the public advocate uh, such things as a power to subpoena uh, evidence. And I would, however, back the what I think was the best innovation of the 1989 Charter Reform, which was the Independent Budget Office, which I was, think has done a great job. And in concluding, I would like to put an idea before you to consider, which would be a large-scale survey of New York City residents that would be big enough in sample to give results at the council level or the community district level that would track how they interact with city government and what impact interacting with city government has on their life course. And this would allow us to answer many, many questions that current data sources do not. Just to give one small example, we're going to have the 2020 census soon. Uh, we could use such a survey to detect where undercount was happening and help to adjust for it. And I think it's an idea worth considering. So thanks very much. Thank you very much. Professor Lane? Thanks for having me. you got to bring the mic up. Make sure the red light is on. Okay. Thanks for having me, and thanks for the good work you've undertaken to do. Uh, I was the executive director and uh, counsel to the Charter Commissions from 86 through 89 and was the uh, chair of the Mayor's Implementation Commission of the new Charter in 1990. I'm going to talk to you very quickly about how we approached these thing, the thing about political and executive power and power we had adopted four or five principles, namely fair representation, clarity and accountability, checks and balances, and meaningful, uh, fair and meaningful representation. Um, and I think that with respect to each of them, we accomplished quite a bit with respect to representation, the city council increase, the maintenance of the um, uh, public advocate, which I hope someone will ask me about because I think John has it entirely wrong. Um, <laughs> the, um, you know, we uh, did a number of things with respect to clarity. We gave the mayor, for example, power to be entirely in charge of contracts uh, so that everybody would know who was in charge of it and a number of other similar things. Um, there are a number of questions I've had in my mind watching you and thinking about government in the um, last um, period of um, years since we uh, did what we did. Um, I think we actually made, so I'm going to talk to you about some mistakes I think we made or some things I think we need to learn from. With respect to the public advocate, I think we should have guaranteed their budget. I'm someone that advocates the continuation. I think when people are talking about how good or bad they are, they forget that from the first council onward, the budget has been slashed in half, three quarters, it's just been brutalized. Um, I think that another very serious thing that I think Gail is intimately knowledgeable about is this member veto that has cropped up under the last speaker for land use decision making in particular districts. I think that's corrupting. I don't mean that in a sense of criminal corrupting. I mean, Legislative bodies are about bearing the full weight of the members on policy, not about giving an individual the right to stop a project in, its, in the area. Uh, I don't know enough about what's happened with fair share. It strikes me that it's gotten, um, I thought it was a great idea when we did it. Uh, we didn't give it money, much teeth. It's been criticized for that. I'm not sure what you would do about it, but I think it's something you could really take a look at. I think the Corporation Council needs to be looked at. Uh, to make it really the, the make the corporation council's office really the city's legal office, um, it's, they have a, it's a great office. They're filled with wonderful people. Many of my students are there, so it, it's not about their. Uh, it's about their sense of who they work for, 
So there might, I think there has to be some council or some other involvement with respect to the uh, Corporation Council. And then some minor things that were big to us when we did it, itemized budgets. I think they've really mucked that up. Or I don't, uh, impoundment by the mayor. I think it's been really, we tried to work through some uh, provisions with respect to it that I'm not sure were good enough to solve the problem. And that's basically it. I'm happy to answer any questions for you. Sorry it was so quick. Thank you. I think there'll be quite a few. Professor Fuchs? Well, when the light is it, red, it's on. The light is red, it's on. Okay, that's a little backwards, but it, it'll work for me. Um, good evening, Chair Benjamin and honorable members of the New York City Charter Revision Commission. Uh, I'm Esther Fuchs, a professor of international and public affairs and political science at Columbia University. And some of you may know, uh, chaired the 2005 New York City Charter Revision Commission. Hi, Steve. <laughs> a, re a repeat offender. Uh, I know I have a very brief amount of time, so I'll try and make my points as briefly as possible. Uh, the Charter Revision Commission comes at a very important time as the public's confidence in national institutions of government are at an all-time low. I don't have to tell you right now, only 18 percent of Americans today say they trust government in Washington to do the right thing. And uh, it gets worse than that. And I'm convinced, as you probably all are, that the strength of our democracy as a nation is ultimately will depend on how well our institutions of local government work. It's sort of on its head from when many of us were in school. But really now, it's the cities that lead on everything, including democratic governance. And in New York City, this will be determined by whether the public thinks that city government is fair, accountable, and responsive to its needs. So I have a couple of specific proposals I want to present to you, but I just want to make three general points first. Um, in a system of democratic governance that intentionally depends on institutions of representation for legitimacy, this process of charter revision is the closest we come to engaging in direct democracy, where the public actually makes policy. Um, so it's important to do no harm, as other people have said, and to recognize that we are fundamentally a representative democracy, which makes the legislative branch, as well as the executive branch, branch exceedingly important from the perspective of maintaining public accountability. And where does the charter fit in in all of this? We like to think of our charter as a constitution. Uh, however, we all know that it is a considerably more expansive document and that the level of arcane detail about the most obscure government agencies uh, minimally gives one pause. The sheer size of the city charter belies this idea that it's a constitution. The constitution had 17 pages on a good day and 17 pages of amendments. Our charter is over 300 pages. Yet there is reason to continue describing the charter as a constitution. Uh, and the document is not exclusively or primarily one of general principles. So as I keep this in context, I want you to bear in mind five very quick, as I ran out of my time, as professors often do, <laughs> I apologize, um, but I want to make five quick proposals in keeping with this idea that our, our, our charter really has two purposes to it. It's a legal framework for the functioning of our local democracy, and it also is a management tool for getting us into the 21st century and operating a service delivery system that's effective. So first on the public advocate issue, um, I'm not, I, I think that issue sort of is done in some way. We have a public advocate. We have to 
let it work. Uh, I certainly, if I had the opportunity to do this over again, I would have certainly figured out something somewhat different from what we have now. Given that we have a public advocate, I think an important thing that the public advocate could do is manage a citizen survey, a little bit along the lines of what, of what um, John was saying, even though we didn't talk to each other. So I propose a citizen survey administered and managed by the public advocate that would be conducted every year, and there's a template for this survey. In 2008, public advocate Betsy Gottbaum conducted a, thir a survey of 130,000 randomly selected New Yorkers. And in my written testimo testimony, I describe what the benefits of this survey could be. So to the extent we're interested in keeping abreast what our public thinks, and given that we have the modern tools of technology, other cities do this, we should be doing this. Community boards. No one's talked much about community boards yet, and I just want to say, reminding everybody, we have 59 community boards. Um, and they're another form of governance structure that was designed to improve our democracy by bringing government closer to individuals in the neighborhoods. It, they don't quite do that, as, as many of you already know. And um, so my proposal at this point, uh, it, and I won't go through the details of the problems with community boards, but my proposal at this point, there are 59 community boards. They are coterminous with nothing. They were supposed to be coterminous with service delivery districts. That hasn't happened. So I don't think we need to eliminate them, but I think we need to make them coterminous with city council districts. I can explain more why I think that uh, at another point, point. Three, I would like to see open primaries and ranked choice voting in general elections. There's no question that the level of participation now in New York City is unacceptable. Um, as a private citizen, I've worked hard to improve this through who's on the ballot. This isn't enough. We, here is where a structural change could help us dramatic, dramatically. Make all registered voters eligible to participate in an open primary for council seats and citywide offices. You could have party labels in this primary. I'm not saying nonpartisan. The top two vote getters would face, face each other in a rank choice general election. Four, a rainy day fund. Others have spoken about this in the context of fiscal issues. Uh, my Charter Revision Commission spent a lot of time on this, and I can explain more why I think we uh, need to create a rainy day fund. Even though we don't have the legal authority as a city to implement it, it would be a, an excellent message to the state legislature so that we actually have something real and accountable and transparent that's put into place so that we can evaluate what's actually going on in our budget. Um, and I know uh, Commissioner Fiala has, might have a lot to say about that. Finally, I'd like to see the room, um, that a change, an important structural change made, regard, made in regard to the Department of Investigation. Make the removal of the Commissioner of Investigation subject to the approval of the Council. This is one of the few places where I think the Council is too weak and the Mayor has too much authority. We are, we are currently in an untenable situation in which it's impossible for a, a Department of Investigation Commissioner to do their job and uh, I won't go into more details about that. There, these, these are my five proposals. They're related to really general principles that I think we can all probably agree upon. And if you're interested in that, you can look at the written testimony or I can answer your questions. Thank you for your indulgence with Thank the you. time. I okay. appreciate it. Um, Carl, then Sal, then Steve, Is there any, then Jim. I'll remind you when you're time is here. Thank you. Um, so first, I really want to thank you, Ms. Delane, um, for what I think everyone generally recognizes is that the 1989 Charter had a very high batting average and got almost everything right. Um, and uh, uh, the city has been the beneficiary of it. And I also want to just personally thank you and Chairman Schwartz for your excellent law review article, which um, really did help at least guide me as I think about the task before us. 
I have two questions, both to — first to you, but to the entire panel. One is um, — you had mentioned uh, councilmanic veto, which uh, is a concern, I think, not only here but in cities throughout the country, um, exacerbated, I suspect, by term limits. And uh, my first question to you is, do you uh, see a, uh, a charter remedy for that problem? That's one issue. And then second, uh, which is um, — uh, more or less a broken record on. In 1989, um, the Charter Commission considered whether to uh, reinstitute uh, the Department of Cities Planning's partnership with OMB uh, on preparing the 10-year capital strategy and shied away from it for reasons that you didn't explain in your Law Review article. And so I'm wondering whether that should be uh, reinstituted or uh, or not, or why you shot away from it at the time. So with respect to — let's start — so I favor getting rid of term limits, but that's not particularly the issue anybody right. asked me about. And I litigated one of those cases, the first one, which we won, uh, that the Council had the power to do it. Um, the, I found — I think that with respect to what's the veto, this is the, in the, the deference given to members, um, determinations about particular land use uh, — uses in their own district. Um, we had created this very elaborate process to stop that kind of decision-making to go to the Council. It was called the triple no. And our point was we couldn't figure out a way to describe the projects that were sort of policy that could go to the Council. So we decided to do it through a process that if they were important enough, they would go to the Council, and if they weren't, they would be stopped at the City Council planning. <coughs> and this was one of the things that we had liked a lot, and we made a political decision to um, change our own approach. And the political decision was because some of our uh, most important supporters in — remember, we have to get a referendum, you have to get something passed, it's a political process, and we were chastised quite strongly by some of our great supporters, um, including Ruth Messenger, who I thought was going to be here for, um, not giving the Council a little more power. And in August, I remember a meeting collapsing on this point. But I got a promise at the time, because Peter Vallone, who was the speaker, was also pushing us to do the same thing. And I got a promise from Peter Vallone that no member would — we got a promise, not me, the commission. So I don't mean to say it, me personally. It was. And that no individual member of the, commission, of the council would get this veto power. And he enforced — he kept his word on that through Gail Benjamin. And so did the following speaker, uh, Miller, through Gail Benjamin. And it only changed that I know about under the, pre the previous speaker. Um, and I was shocked. I heard about it one day, and now it's been written about in the papers. For example, the New York — the Center on Court Innovations attempt to place some — make some changes and bring some drug courts and other forts of court to Brooklyn is — you know, so citywide projects are getting — that are important and go through a whole process before they're ready to go are getting stopped by council members, you know, um, individualized uh, powers, which I think is a very bad thing, because what it does to the council is, since only one member cares about it, it starts to get horse trading. So it's not a policy issue. It's an individual member issue, so everybody will go along. So when that council member's opportunity to stop something, everybody will go along with that. So that's what I meant when I said it was corrupting. I don't mean people are getting paid off. I mean, it doesn't work to the benefit of the sort of policy making of a council. And I don't, you know, other than we struggled a long time with this and other than the triple no or some procedural way of doing this that keeps these small decisions, I'm not sure how to stop it. I have to think about it some more. And then on the second point, I honestly don't know the answer to your question, but I can assure you this is with respect to the OMB and the City Planning Commission on the 12-year plan. Um, I honestly don't even remember having a discussion about it, so I can look — I'm going to — I'll talk to Fritz and get in touch with all of you and give you the answer to that, because, or Frank Morrow, who probably was involved in that. But I don't know the answer. Right? 
Okay. Thank you, uh, Sal. Thank you. Not a moment too soon. Yeah. Uh, Professor Fuchs, uh, let me say I, I agree with you 100% on open primaries, and uh, I was one of the advocates here. Unfortunately, uh, it's been uh, eliminated from consideration by a vote of the commission. But I, I, I think it's uh, – I, I would have loved for us to delve into it further because I think it does <coughs> – enhanced participation and opens up the process. Uh, Professor Malenkoff, I have a question for you. You, 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 kind of, you agree with me about the public advocate. Uh, I, I never could get my, my, wrap my arms around that position since 1989. Uh, I, and, and I also pointed out to uh, Doug Musio, who testified <laughs> that Andrew Stein was partially one of the reasons why this thing, right. uh, th this uh, public advocate position was uh, kept intact. The, the question I have for you is, if, if the public advocate is really a vestigial structure uh, and we don't give it any enhanced, more enhanced responsibilities, why keep it? The argument in, well, first of all, if we all accept the idea that the public advocate is mainly a stepping stone to citywide office, it gives people a chance to run a citywide race to see where their constituencies of support are or are not on a citywide basis and to gain citywide visibility. It's a relatively inexpensive way to add to the pool of potential candidates for mayor. On the other hand, I agree with you that I, I think in the nature of the office, it is very hard for a public advocate to fulfill the hopes that the commission in 1989 had for it in terms of being able to uh, be an ombuds person to uh, negotiate between the city government and individual uh, wrongs that might have been committed at a district level. I think city councilors are just much better prepared to do that job. And in terms of highlighting issues that haven't received sufficient attention, um, any time a public advocate does that, he or she is inevitably interpreting those issues in terms of what's going to advance my political career and, and not what, what are the issues really. So I'm, I'm skeptical that the public advocate can fulfill the functions that were hoped for. But on the other hand, uh, it's, it's, it's not a huge cost in an, an 88 plus billion dollar office, and it does put another person in the citywide debate about the issues facing the city. Well, don't we have, we have five borough presidents, we got the speaker of the city council, and we got a whole horde of other people that want to run for mayor. We have to create an office so somebody can get exposure? Well, I, I, I think if, if the commission members want to strengthen all of those people that you mentioned, then um, eliminating the office of public advocate would probably be a pretty good step from their point of view. But uh, I'm sure and we, we've elected some very fine public advocates, and I'm sure they would disagree vociferously with that. Well, point. yeah, I mean, Mr. It's, oh, okay, I, it's no reflection on the people. I'm talking about systemically. I mean, where does this office fit in? Not well, in my view, but perhaps Eric disagrees with the origin story that... I'm sure he I, does. I mean, he was... No, the, no, I was at the origin, so... Yeah, I know. And I think everybody just heard me say when there was a political deal that I think went wrong, I just acknowledged it to you. But I'm going to tell you on this one, there wasn't the slightest political deal. This was done for two reasons. One, a legal reason, and one, a good government reason. Let's start with the good government reason. Nat Leventhal, who you all, many of you know, was the first deputy mayor of the city for many years, um, was the lead person who made the argument that when he had been the first deputy mayor, the public, the, then the city council president, but um, played a very important role for him to watch what his bureaucracy was doing. It was an oversight function that he found very helpful. So he took the lead in the commission on pushing for that. And um, given the intensity and density of what the administrative aspects of city government are, we felt that that was an important thing, even if it was just a little here and a little there. 
that there wasn't enough oversight. And at the time we did this, the council had had no experience in oversight. And to raise, to say for them that they would be an institution that could do oversight, I think personally would have been a laughable position to take. Uh, I don't know where they are in their oversight now. I know they've become a much better body, a much more serious legislative body, but I don't know enough about what they do in that case. The second reason we did it, it would have been illegal. We would have been knocked out of the box if we didn't do that. Because in 1989, the Justice Department took its Section 5 uh, responsibilities very seriously. And when we went down for three months review, uh, they reviewed everything we had done. And they were looking for any diminution of minority power. And so one of our big staying, sticking points and pushing points with them was that we had created this a public advocate or city council president still to create an opportunity for minorities to get citywide positions or how about attorney generals of the state of New York and you will recall in 1989 you know this is a whole different time we didn't have a mayor Dinkins elected we had never had a minority elected to any position except council independently there were a number of council members that had been appointed to be borough presidents so but then they and ran again but they had never been so we were looking at this as a two things one an oversight function and two a voting rights demand and that is the sole reason that we supported this and I challenge anybody to find one drop of evidence that suggests that oh. and I can tell you plenty of political things we did but Andrew Stein was not one of them well <laughs> professor Fuchs I um, could differ but right so so other people disagree with your uh, origin story but I'm really not interested in that at this point and I just want to make two comments about the public advocate position to the extent it served a purpose in 1989, that's all well and good. I think everybody realizes whatever the purpose is now, it's a, from a governance point of view, at least, it's hard to find that governance purpose. Um, I think you're right to point out that it's been a stepping stone for minorities to get elected to broader public office. Is it a training ground to be mayor? Absolutely not. It probably probably emphasizes the wrong things that you would want a mayor to be able to do uh, when they become mayor. It's almost the opposite of being mayor, where, you know, and I won't elaborate on that because it's fairly obvious. So I didn't get the impression that anybody, <laughs> that anybody really had the appetite here to try and propose getting rid of the public advocate in a complex, multicultural, large city like New York it, it probably makes sense to have other citywide elected officials. Um, I, don't, I don't think one has to really create, give more power to the public advocate. I think Betsy Gottbaum actually got the public advocate's job correctly. She was a public advocate. Um, if there needs to be more funding for that position, I think that's fair. There should be more funding, but it should not be um, codified in a, in a city charter, the level of funding needs to be left uh, open and negotiated in a budget process like everything else. But I, I would suggest that, that having the pub, giving the public advocate the tool of a, of a yearly survey and articulating the interests of the public and also being a conduit for the public's view on service delivery, which is partly what they do anyway, uh, would actually be a useful tool for the public advocate in informing the operational side of city budget. But beyond, beyond that, you know, I'm sort of like uh, over the public advocate and I think we spend too much time worrying about its purpose. If I could just comment briefly. if. We, Esther and I both agree on the importance of this kind of survey, but I would worry that if the public advocate were in charge of the process, that the survey would be politicized in some way and, and not really dig into the fundamentals that are, that are needed. And if I could also just say that <laughs> open, open primaries, which both um, the, um, Mr. Albanese and, and Professor Fuchs think are a good idea, that the positive argument for that would be there's roughly 30 percent of the electorate that's locked out because they're either not declaring a party or they're Republican or other third parties. And so there's an argument to open up the process to them. 
Um, but all of the experience with open primaries, for example, California by state constitution requires all municipal elections uh, to be in this form. And actually the turnout has f is low and has fallen in those places because parties are a key mobilizer in politics. And if you more or less take the parties out of the, out of the process, it reduces participation. So I, I know this sounds somewhat paradoxical to say, but I think that New York City would benefit from a far stronger Republican Party than it has, and to actually really contest general elections more effectively. Wait a minute. Uh, Steve is actually next. Just a quick, a quick follow-up on that uh, open. My suggestion was not to take the parties out. My suggestion was an open primary, but not a nonpartisan primary. So you can still have party labels. You can still have parties be active. I'm just concerned, particularly among young people who do not, who are less likely to register for a political party. We are excluding them from the most important election in the city of New York. And voter registration is low, and voter participation is low, and we're all on the same page and wanting to increase it. So I don't believe the parties have anything to be frightened of <laughs> in an open primary. And the idea, of course, to say we should have a stronger Republican Party is like saying, well, you know, it should snow in July. So we're not, it's not happening in New York. So I believe we need to be reality-based here about what the kinds of things we're doing to change structural aspects of city governance to make it work better to improve our democracy. And we certainly could do that if we had open primaries in which you could identify people with party labels. Steve, and then Jim. Uh, Dr. Fuchs, I've been waiting for 30 years for a stronger Republican Party, so I think it, it, <laughs> might, it might snow in July 1st. I think you're right. Um, let me just preface my remarks by saying this. I had the privilege of serving on the Fuchs Commission, oh. and what I will tell you is <clears throat> we, you know, sometimes we can go through charter fatigue. Right? We've had a lot of charter revision commissions since the 89, you know, the, the gold standard. The Fuchs Commission, in my estimation, got it right because, and, and we'll go down as probably the commission with the least glamour, but it was two years, <laughs> and what you did was lead a group of people to take a serious look at the charter, and identify certain touch points that could be shored up to strengthen the next 30, 50, 100 years. And we're living with the legacy of your commission, and I'm very, very grateful for, for that. And I was grateful to serve under you on that. I, my question for you, and I have one for Dean Lane, my question for you, Professor Fuchs, uh, was going to be twofold, but you just addressed uh, the open primaries. If you want to expound a little more, you can. But you were right, uh, the rainy day fund. If you wouldn't mind giving a more expansive uh, uh, thought to that. Uh, and I'll give my question uh, to Dean Lane now. Uh, there's probably nobody that we have heard from or will hear from uh, during this commission that can offer us greater a forward guidance than you. Um, your, your written word and your verbal commentary uh, over the last 30 years, quite voluminous. Um, so your thoughts matter. I want to piggyback on what Commissioner Weisbrod had to say, and that was to thank you for the leadership role you played in 89. You know, we like to point out the things that don't work. Uh, this is a damn good document. Uh, that you crafted and uh, got through the legal and the political muster coupled with the aspirational goals that you all envisioned. But the question for you relates to specifically to an area that you said uh, you thought maybe there was a miscalculation in hindsight, and that was that borough voice, the evisceration of the role of borough presidents. What do you think now in hindsight, 30 years into this experiment, could we do to fine-tune, to take a scalpel, not an axe, to your work and enhance the role of the borough president without disrupting that very delicate balance of, of the, the, the model that you created. Whoever wants to go first. Uh. I'll go first. And um, I think I, I made my point clear on the open primaries. Uh, I, I think they you can identify parties and have open primaries. So 
you don't eviscerate the role of the parties, which I think are very important in mobilizing voters and helping people to cue on things that they think are important, particularly when they don't have a lot of information. But I think we really do have to ensure that everyone has the opportunity to participate in competitive elections. And our general elections have historically not been very competitive. And the turnout speaks to that. We had 23 percent turnout in the last general election for mayor. Um, and so we are declining uh, in our participation and doing much worse uh, than the rest of the country, frankly, on that score. On, on the rainy day fund, and, and thank you for those kind words. I'm very embarrassed. And, I, and <laughs> Commissioner Fial, I said he was, he, was, uh, he was a stalwart, as he is now, having, doing this again. Uh, there must be a place in, in uh, good government heaven for you and people who serve more than one time on charter revision commissions. Um, but you are always a an amazing commissioner, and uh, they're lucky to have you on here in 2019. Um, the Rainy Day Fund, which is complicated, of course, by state law, um, the reason I brought it up is it is part of some of the proposals that have already come out of the commission, but it is a very important fix given the complexity of our uh, city government and the complexity of our finances now, and the need to make things as transparent and clear as possible for the public. So much is complicated, and as a consequence of not being able to have a real rainy day fund, our, our OMB has figured out ways to put away money, and this has all been well and good, but it, it, it should not be that difficult. And we, the public should be able to understand how much money is in fact in a rainy day fund that we are really putting away for when the economy will invariably decline, because it always does, and, and how much uh, we are in the hole. I mean, there is a tendency for mayors to spend it all down and not leave much for the next mayor. And by not having a transparent rainy day fund, it's really hard for the average or even the educated person to tell what actually is the status of New York City finances uh, in terms of a cushion for a downturn in the economy. So what we could do as a city is, is pass this charter measure as a message to the state legislature and have it sort of ready to be encoded in our charter. But if we don't do anything dramatic like that and call attention to it through a commission like this, the legislature will not act, not because they don't care. It's just not sexy. It's not an issue that anybody really pays attention to. It's hard to get fiscal things on the agenda altogether unless there is a crisis. By the time there's a crisis, it's too late. So I think this is an opportunity to do something proactive in a really, really important area uh, for the city right now. Can I make a, a, a quick point about the borough presidents? Um, I, I just, um, you know, for a long time, <laughs> I actually thought, we should get rid of the borough presidents and have a second house in the legislature, sort of like an upper house that, you know, was elected in the way that uh, reflects populations in a way and have since since, the, since we can't have a board of estimate, we, we don't have that kind of upper legislative body anymore and we're a big city and uh, it seemed like a sort of interesting idea that we might have uh, an upper house. Having thought about it over the years, this is why it's never good to make drastic structural changes because there's always unintended consequences, as I'm sure Eric can speak to quite well. Um, you know, I don't really think we need an upper house anymore. I think one legislative body is quite sufficient for the city of New York right now. and um, and. Uh, yeah, we'll just leave it at that. Uh, quite sufficient, and and I, I, you know, I really thought that the borough presidents, in some ways, are divisive. Right? It, it, it encourages people not to think of themselves as New Yorkers, not to think about a citywide agenda, but still in this old category of borough. And so, 
my, my view has sort of come full circle. The city is complex and difficult for people to navigate, and the borough presidents are an intermediary for people to understand place and space and connect. And anything that can help people connect to our city in a positive way now, I'm in favor of. So while I don't think we need to give an extraordinary p amount of power to the borough presidents, I think they help people feel represented in, in a very complex city where uh, it's very difficult. So Eric? We actually did think and discuss, and it may be in our book, the two-house legislature we had a long debate about it, and we rejected it. I know. And um, and I, wa I want to start with, a, since Esther was talking about what's real, I want to start with something what's real, which is you're going to have the borough presidents right. after this is done. So you, I don't believe you could possibly pass a referendum without them uh, if you eliminated the borough presidents. That was our thinking in 89, not that we were going to do it. But what, what we needed to do was to find a role for them. Um, um, I mean, I think Esther's description of that sort of middle-level person, somebody that you can reflect, relate to in your community or in your borough is very important because people in New York actually do identify themselves by borough. Uh, we actually did a number of studies of that, but I don't have to tell you about Staten Island and <laughs> Queens and Brooklyn. I mean, people think of themselves by their borough and by their community and less by New York City. I think. Uh, and, and so I think that the borough president's role is an important role. Well, our goal was to try to give them some partial form of executive role. Since we were ending their sort of mixed role on the board of uh, estimate, so we wanted to put them into the executive type of role, which had to do with some budgeting, some more land use power, and some more service power, minor as it might be. Um, I don't know enough. I haven't followed strongly enough to know whether we were successful in not or doing it. But I do think, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not so prescient that I could tell you what the future should hold for the borough presidents. But uh, you know, I do think along the lines that we attempted tried to make sense. So we were balancing this idea of we do have a whole city. It's the city of New York, so you can't say give zoning power. If you did, you'd have to create a council in those um, in each borough also because zoning power is legislative. Well, we couldn't say, you know, we didn't, we just tried to find enough to have real work that would make a difference and real opportunities for borough presidents to weigh in on issues uh, that, they, that mattered to them so they had to be listened to in the political, political discourse over any particular issue. Um, you know, I don't know whether we succeeded or whether we, you know, I argued for a long time after, a couple of years after, that it, that it seemed to be working. I think Ruth Messenger at one point was a big advocate of the changes that we had made. But to be honest with you, I've lost sort of sight of what's been going on with respect to that. But, I de but in terms of what I would be built, looking, if I was wanted to empower them more, it would be along the lines of what we were discussing in the, you know, a little more land use, more service, more opportunities to weigh in on topics that really concern their community. I mean, I don't know what else to tell you. I wish I could get, come up with a list of 10 things, and if you charge me for doing it, charge me to do it, I guess I would do it for you, but I don't have it right off the top of my head. Well, could I, I, ask, you, could you, I ask you this specifically me. to help yes. guide my own thinking yeah, yeah, on course. this? Uh, would you characterize um, uh, the following two recommendations that I'm going to offer here uh, as being too disruptive to the balance of, of uh, the framework we have now. Uh, the, the great argument over the last 30 years is that borough presidents haven't had a meaningful voice, that the charter contemplates a role for them. The, the charter even codifies in language uh, a specific voice. But it falls just a little short of compelling uh, that that voice be respected in a meaningful way. So over the years, for example, a suggestion was made that a particular section be amended to require that the mayor provide the details uh, behind the reasons for his not incorporating a borough president's fiscal recommendations. Is that something so onerous that it would disrupt no. the, the power? Okay. And the second one would be compelling 
uh, the attendance of uh, city commissioners and other officials uh, to appear before uh, a borough board or monthly uh, meeting of the borough president. Would that disrupt? When the you pow- say compelling, you know, I'm not, you're not talking about subpoenas, right? You're no, 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 no subpoena power. Just an affirmative responsibility, right? And I, uh, is there no? Right now, don't deputy, don't well, I forget what they call them, borough commissioners meet with the board of uh, with the borough presidents. Some do, some don't. The great, the great argument over the years was, A, we're halfway there, we're not all the way there. So we're trying to figure out a way to provide some procedural leverage that doesn't I would not have a problem there. with that. You wouldn't. Okay. Thank we you talked so very about much. That. Thank you. Okay. Jim? And thank, thank you, by the way, for your comments about, my, about our commission. I appreciate that. Thank you all for being here. And uh, I certainly feel the same way. Uh, the work you did has influenced my uh, 25 years in city government, and uh, and I, I think that that you got it, you know, 99 percent right. And I I, I I agree with Eric uh, on a couple of areas where I think there could be improvement. And most, a lot of what I'm looking at in terms of improvement is I've read a lot of the transcripts of the 89 Commission. I wasn't in New York. Well, I had just moved to New York in 1989, actually. Uh, and uh, I know one area was budget, uh, where it seems clear to me that what the Charter Revision Commission in 89 intended to happen in the budget process never happened. Uh, I give as one example uh, the Department of Homeless Services. I think it's got about, I think it's a budget of about $2 billion and $1.9 billion is in one unit of appropriation. And if you look at the charter language, it says particular program, institution, or activity, uh, and it says that multi-purpose units of appropriation can be maintained only if the council adopts a resolution uh, allowing that. And I have, and that's the language that was added by the 89 Commission to allow the continuation of big units of appropriation if the council and the mayor agreed. Uh, I was finance council for many years to the city council and acting finance director. There was never a resolution allowing that, but the units of appropriation never changed from pre-1989 to post-1989. So in areas like that, and I guess I I know what Eric's answer is, impoundment, the same thing. I don't think it was ever contemplated that the the mayor, like Mayor Giuliani did, would use impoundment because he was in a fight with the speaker. And so he said, if you pass your own budget, I'm going to impound all the council programs, which is what happened. why not fix these things where there have been abuses? Uh, I, I guess I'll ask that to uh, the other two uh, panelists. You're not. You're asking them. Yeah, I, mean, I know what you're, you're looking asking. at me. But well, I know. <laughs> and, and Eric, then Eric, you. you well, let me. You, you don't think I should give my answer to other people? You want to keep it a secret? Why well, you? You <laughs> yeah, go with the We end. would like to hear your answer, Eric, go if ahead, you don't mind, Eric. Jim. <laughs> We're here On the um, items of appropriation, I think they may or should, you, but I am surprised, and you and I have had this discussion over the years, that the council, what happens is the council rushes to pass the budget at the last minute, and nobody makes a battle over this, and, you know, it seemed to me that if the council staked out the position sooner that they would not go forward unless there was some, you know, really pr- put pressure on it, I think you would have a better outcome. Uh, but I do think for a good councilmatic review of a budget, you definitely need items of appropriation. $1.9 billion for homeless services, you know, we, you don't have any idea what they're paying for the council. So the council is just approving anything what the mayor wants. And, and yes, there's a history and they know more than I'm saying, but in theory, they should be doing a little better. And on, I didn't think impoundments really has to be worked through. Our intention was to make it harder to impound money, to make the council, you know, much more a participant in this. It shouldn't be a political weapon. Um, And if it has become a political weapon between mayor, then I think that you have to take some steps. It's a very serious issue because it once again, it denies the council its budget role by doing that. 
On the budget, I would just say two things, and on the issues of, of, of units of appro appropriation, I mean, it seems to me the Council has, and I'm not a lawyer, but has authority right now to get more details on the budget where it requests, and has the authority to do oversight. Um, and I would like to see more robust oversight and the uh, Council to use its existing authority around the budget that it already has. Um, to codify in the Charter the level of detail around appropriation uh, that you seem to be suggesting makes me just a little bit nervous. I think there has to be flexibility in budgeting um, because things change and there has to be room to, for commissioners, for the mayor, for the people on the side of implementing programs to make changes on the ground as problems change. So. Are we at an extreme position in the Department of Homeless Services? Yes. Should the council be yelling and screaming now and asking for more information and demanding uh, in using its oversight role about what's going on on homeless service for God's sake? Yes. I mean, I'll do it if they don't. I mean, we all should be doing that now on homeless services because we have no idea where the money is being spent. And that's a big problem across the board in social services. Having, you know, having said that, I don't know that creating a charter amendment in this area will really resolve the operational problem and the oversight problem that I think is really the issue here. Maybe there should be a ceiling on the amount of money you can put in one unit of appropriation. And that might be a way of thinking about it thinking about it so you don't, you know, you don't have this big bundle of God knows what uh, sitting in a budget and it forces everybody to come to terms with it. And that would be the way at this point I would think about, I would think about that. I don't, I, you know, I really hesitate to tie the hands of people who have to do the work on the ground. Um, that always creates problems. Uh, on impoundment, you know, I sort of agree with Eric. I, I don't see it as a huge problem. I think there are mayors who might have taken advantage of this o over time, but it doesn't seem to me to be anything at this point that warrants uh, warrants a char charter charter revision. I just want to agree that uh, I don't think the charter is necessarily a good way to fix this <coughs> problem. If there's a, a a pattern in practice of how things are done. It usually reflects some interest in, in the process doing it that way, and uh, any kind of engineering of it, re-engineering of it, would, would have to take into account what all those interests are. And, and I think a sim simple statement uh, in, in the Charter is not likely to, to do that. Can I just, you know, in, a, we, we, in the Charter there is a requirement that the mayor provide items of appropriation, not one. That makes that a ridiculous <laughs> idea, it, and it doesn't. But I don't know how to change the charter to fix that. You pass a rule, a law that says you have to have itemized budget and we mean it. I mean, I'm not <laughs> sure what you're going to put into this thing. I mean, it's a, somewhere along the line, this is about a political process, and I believe if the speaker were to call up the mayor on day one of the budget and say, I want items of appropriation, what do you, I mean, you've been there for years. What do you think would happen? Well, I think a couple Sorry things happened, and I think one of the things is that when the council did try to create smaller units of appropriation, <laughs> the law department, who I think should be subject to council, more council accountability, uh, came up with arguments that that wasn't allowed. Uh, in, in the 98 budget, when the council passed its own budget, the, they they used terms and conditions to try to say, you know, X amount of money in this will be used for these types of programs. And I believe the law department said in the, uh, that Giuliani said that the law department said that you couldn't use terms and conditions to subdivide units of appropriation. Uh, so there have been these arguments made <laughs> to, you know, call into question the council's ability to create it? units of How appropriation. You, I mean, and I think the part of it is that the language of the charter gives the council the ability to keep the large units of appropriation, not to create 
smaller units because it starts from the premise that the units of appropriation will be small, and then if the council wants to, they can keep the larger units of appropriation. So I think there is that some some clarity we we could bring to that. And then the 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 big thing was though that I believe that after the 98 budget, when the mayor didn't spend or said he was not going to spend a dime of any of the council programs, that seriously influenced the council against trying to exercise its full budget powers, because they thought that in the end, whatever power they exercised, the mayor could just sort of drop an anvil on their heads. But it's very hard to change. I mean, you're describing a political battle where the council basically got scared off. Let me, let me use that phrase. I'm a little nervous about those kind of words, but basically that's what happened. And I think you have to stand up on these, on these kinds of issues. Um, I can't imagine if you started on day one and he, he, these budget items, you know, whenever the budget comes out, it doesn't have to pay, you have till June 30th. We end up, you, we tend to do these budgets in the last 10 days or 15 days or more in the budget office. So, what about on day one if someone pushed back and said, we, it has to be the speaker, not someone. And we want items of appropriation. I mean, I, I think that it is wrong not to have more items of appropriation so the council can do its democratic charter demanded view of reviewing the budget and creating the budget. So it's wrong not But the do. council can ask for more items of appropriation now. But and they, they should. But they, I, depending on who you can, who you ask, but they you've tied it in other issues, impoundment, the corporation council's position. So I mean, it's too detailed, right? right. Okay. So, sorry, sorry, Jim, are you? Uh, I, can I ask one, or can I come back with a? I ask one more. Okay. Um, in terms of you know, there's there is one area where I think that people feel that they're isn't adequate engagement, and that that is when we consider these large uh, rezoning, large ULARP applications. Usually they're city applications. They have a really big impact on a neighborhood, and communities all over the city feel like when the ULARP clock starts running, the thing is already 90 percent baked, and we haven't had a voice in it. Is there something that the three of you think can be done about that without, you know, upending the land use process, the ULERP time clock? Uh, I just, I throw that out to all of you. Well, this, I mean, my answer would be the city council people are, are the ones that would be key actors in that, in that process. And, you know, the council at the end of the day does have a, have a critical role. So there, there is a path for having, if the council people want to organize the input, there, there is a path for it. I also noticed a proposal for, you know, a 10-year city plan, which I didn't bring up in this process, but think that would be an extremely important thing to finally do. And to the extent that that's done, I see that Carl's not excited about a 10-year city plan. <laughs> I know why not. Um, but that gives, that shines a light on land use in a way that it's impossible for ordinary people to do anything now. And I think that in that, if we had that, then there would be some better understanding of, you know, large rezonings. I'm not interested in obstructing those processes or making them more difficult than they already are. Um, you know, there are other things in land use maybe we could fix, but right now uh, NIMBY seems to be one of the bigger problems, uh, not, not the larger, and, and giving away large swaths of land to one developer and then forgetting about the oversight role. So I assume what you're saying is, I mean, obviously, by the time when something goes to the City Planning Commission, the staff has to have done a lot of work, and because you can't just dump it on them and not have done your work. So there's going to. So I assume what you're asking is, should there be some interim moment in the staff process where the community, where they give notice to the community, or something like that? Yeah. <laughs> 
I don't know. I, I mean, in one sense, the council gets all those big zoning changes, right? So our notion always was that the council would have the teeth to make that happen, although it is at the end of the process. There's no question, and it's very hard to make many changes. Um, I, I just, I, I actually don't think this would work well. Um, where, you know, somewhere along the way when they say they're at 50 percent or there's some marker that would get the, I'd have to see the uh, kind of proposal about that to give you my view. I was, we were very interested in community participation in our charter commission, but we were also very interested in making sure that, you know, the expertise of the city could have the opportunity to um, operate as it should. And, you know, we wanted to use the channels, the the, the, the real decision-making channels for this, so the City Planning Commission, the Borough Presidents, and the uh, City Council to be the place. I, I don't know how it could fit in earlier. I don't. I just don't know. Isn't that okay. what the community boards are supposed to yeah, be doing? Yeah, but they're after this point where he's talking about. They're coming in after it's gone certification. To the city planning certification. Okay. Okay, uh, I have a few questions, but I'm not going to ask them in the interest of time, and we have a number of other panels and people waiting. So what I have after, I'd like to reserve my right to send you my questions, and I'd love it if you would answer them to me, and I will distribute it. Allison, you're next. And then Sal, if you could be quick, because we have three more panels, folks. Thank you. I'll try to be brief. Um, this is for... Um, Mr. Lane and Jim actually reminded me of this question. I guess I have two questions. One, um, you mentioned in the uh, issues that you feel like the original 1989 Charter Revision Commission sort of did wrong or missed, you mentioned the Corporation Council and the role of the Corporation Council, and I'm interested in um, how you would recommend changing that, because that's been a big topic of conversation. And then I was, I'm was i also interested in, to know whether you have any thoughts or suggestions as to how better to execute the fair share criteria. <coughs> um, uh, Borough President Messenger, in her written testimony, uh, had some a proposal around giving the borough presidents more of an authority over fair share in their borough instead of the local council member, and I thought that was an interesting idea and didn't know whether you had any thoughts. So the Corporation Council is a very, um, in some ways, very tricky question. I mean, it's, the office has been a wonderful office. It employs really good lawyers. It's a very competitive place. But, and for 90% of the legal work of the city, they do a phenomenal job. But then there becomes this part where they also start to serve as the mayor's council. And as the council, since 89, grew in power, there were more and more disputes that started to arise between the council and the mayor, and you would find the city council, basic, uh, the mayor basically, the council, corporation council, basically taking the mayor's side on a regular time. And there were even a couple cases where after the law had passed, the mayor had vetoed the law, and then the, count, then the corporation council supported a litigation <coughs> to say that the law was invalid and it was preempted, which struck me as simply amazing that you would go through the democratic process of the city and then the corporation council who wanted the mayor's view to be become real, become realized, would bring a lawsuit even though his, um, he had been overridden, his veto had been overridden. So I, I think there has to be some other way of doing this, either giving the council its own uh, lawyers with real power in those situations or, you know, perhaps m making the, um, giving some term limit to the corporation council or review of the corporation with advice and consent of the Senate, of the uh, council or something like that. Uh, I think there just has to be some accountability of the corporation council to the other um, all of the other parts of government, so it could be the control of the borough presidents. There has to be some other way of uh, striking um, this this check and balance. The Corporation Council just has too much power in these circumstances. You know, they are the voice of the city with respect to law, but, you know, it can't always be that they're just the mayor's voice, and that's a political voice, what the mayor wants. And with respect to fair share, 
So we, the idea of fair share came from a group, a bunch of community groups saying that they had net community groups and boards saying things would just appear in their neighborhoods, period. They were there one day, they weren't, they weren't there one day, and they were tended to be poorer neighborhoods, and poor neighborhoods would re frequently get dumped in less political opposition, lower priced property. So you could do it, right? It was easier to do. The fair share plan that we offered was an attempt to get it to be discussed, you know, the statement of needs and the fair share to get it. So our goal here was simply to create a discussion where we hoped that the principle of fair share would inform a discussion and then push back against the city's just dumping of things into particular districts. Um, apparently, it, I, you know, from what I read and what I've talked to people about, it hasn't worked in any way that we intended it. And I'm very sorry for that because I think it was, it's a very important idea for the city. And, you know, I don't, I haven't really thought through the way to give it some more teeth. And if the borough president plays a role that's important in that, you know, could play a role, that might be a very good power to give them. Um, they're certainly more sensitive to the districts, the people, the group, the neighborhoods in their own boroughs and is the mayor as a whole. I mean, because, you know, they're elected through that, all of that. So I think that might be a good suggestion, but I really don't have a key answer to this. A quick point on the, uh, on the, on the uh, Corporation Council issue. It's, it is in some ways similar to uh, the question about giving the council more heft on the budget side, having more capacity to evaluate the right. uh, budget. And so it seems to me what needs to be done is that the council needs to build up its legal capacity at this point. Obviously, it's not going to create a Corporation Council's office just like it didn't create an OMB. But it needs to have sufficient capacity to review these kinds of things and to have disagreements with the executive side. I don't think one should assume that we need to create an enormous capacity because constantly there's going to be legal disagreements with the executive side. If the executive can't operate in a way that reflects the citywide infra interest and that the council agrees upon most of the time, uh, then we're in big trouble, I think. So, uh, you know, I, I think that this is just an opportunity for the council to build up its operation, its legal operation, so that it can deal with this. Sal, quickly. Yeah, uh, just a reaction to uh, Professor Fuchs on, on oversight. I, I, I was a critic of the council, as you know, Gail, when I was there about uh, us not conducting rigorous oversight. And I, I, I hate to say this, that's still happening today. I, I don't think it's, a, it's not a sexy uh, uh, practice. It takes a lot of work, got to drill down, and the council has never done that effectively, including today. Uh, I have a quick question on, on ethics and anti-corruption as part of the charter reform. Uh, we have uh, a number of incredible uh, practices which I think are, um, are problematic. For example, uh, a lobbyist can't contribute, can't give an elected official $50, but they can bundle tens of thousands of dollars in donations. <laughs> uh, doesn't make sense. And, and the other area that I like to focus on is lobbying reform. We have a revolving door where um, we should ban lobbying for five years for elected officials uh, or even uh, on a lifetime basis. I was wondering if you, Eric and, and Professor Fuchs and Professor Malenkoff, if you have any thoughts on, on anti-corruption provisions or measures that should be in the charter because people in the city have to have full faith in the government that it minimizes conflicts of interest. You want me to start? Go ahead. What do you want? Uh, the only thought that I have is uh, there are a lot of power in, powerful interests in the city that want city government to do things uh, that, that they're seeking, and, and they will find a way to influence <coughs> policy no matter the details of the charter. So you can kind of rearrange the deck chairs a little bit. But uh, I, I don't think there's anything magical that you can do in a charter to curtail the powerful interest from seeking their, their, their end. So a anything that would make that process more visible is, 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 is a good thing. Um, certainly our, our public finance system for local offices is a model for the rest of the country. 
uh, and has opened up access to office uh, far wider than just about any other jurisdiction <coughs> uh, in, in, in the country. So I, I guess it's worth thinking about, but I, I'm skeptical that we'll come up with a, a charter-based uh, a- answer to the problem. I think the sight of a council member or a senior staff member lobbying the legislature right after they leave office is very bad. Um, even if they don't have whatever they're doing, however good they're doing it, I don't think I think the public doesn't like that at all. We, the, one of the hardest battles we had, I think, in 1988 under the Ravage Commission, was over uh, that I, I forget what we called the clause, but the ethics provision that stops you from being there one for one year, you can't do it. And I mean, we were just rocked and socked on that one by many pe- good meaning, well meaning people in the government. The only thing I could think about doing about that is you might extend that to two years. I, I don't think people necessarily come into office or into staff with the idea that they're immediately going to become lobbyists, and that's the only way they'll well, It happens in. soon after they leave. <laughs> well, they have to wait a year for anybody on any kind of high level, as I, as I remember the law we passed. Unless they're going to a not-for-profit. Unless they're going for a not-for-profit. Um, I think that's the only thing you do because, you know, there are First Amendment rights that come into play here, state constitutional rights that come in to say if somebody can't lobby for five years, I think you run into some Well, I, I, don't, I, think, I don't think that's the case because there are, okay. there are provisions across the country with a five-year ban. In Washington, they're proposing a lifetime ban. I'm sorry. I, I would just suggest that minimally it should be a three-year <clears throat> three ban on lobbying. I think five years is a little too far in the distant future for people to get their arms around. But three years, I think, can be managed, and it's reasonable, and it won't discourage people from going into public service, as, as everybody likes to say when you put these bans on. And I, I, I want to reiterate my point about the independence of the commissioner of the Department of Investigation. There is something substantial that can be done. Um, around the corruption issue, and it's to ensure that the mayor doesn't have the sole authority to remove the commissioner of the Department of Investigation, that it must be done with the consent of the city council. And while I'm not in general think that the city council needs to be involved in a whole lot of uh, things as it relates to the executive side and the operations of government, in this instance, we really have a problem, uh, and we, you know, Regardless of the details of the situation, this past DOI commissioner was involved in a lot of things that the mayor did not like. And uh, the consequence of, of not having a full-throated discussion, the council didn't even take it up, actually, when they could have in some way. At least we need to force the council to engage in this process and uh, be complicitous in whatever is going on or stand up and be heard. I think you just have to, if you, this will be a second. Yeah, I assume this you is have a lawyer. Concluding the, remark, Eric. I, ass, I assume you have a lawyer for the council, so you, for, the, many. for you guys, for the commission, and you ought to take a look yeah. at whether or not that idea um, is legal to have the council involved in the removal of a public official, that executive official. Okay, that is one of the things that has been suggested by others, and that our attorneys are looking at and reviewing. And with that said, I'd like to thank all of you. I know it's a lot more than the half an hour we uh, tempted you to come here with, but I really appreciate your coming and would love to hear more from you and to talk. As you know, Eric, we've talked before at greater length. Um, Thank you very much. Um, The next panel... Um, is on the Board of Standards and Appeals and is will be joined by Marjorie Perlmutter, Manashi, Sh- Manashi, I can never say your last name, I'm really sorry, Siravasan, and Gabe Tausig, a former member of that lauded institution that uh, we just ended the last panel on. <laughs> Um, there's a bigger, yeah. Each of you will have approximately three minutes. I know you've waited a long time, so I'm loath to make 
you pay for the fact that we're running very slowly, but if you could be mindful of the clock, um, both I and I believe the last panel would be appreciative. Okay. Oh, this is very sh short chair. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like a yeah. <laughs> I just want to make sure everyone has the package because it's a little bit of following along with visuals. You okay. are. You are okay. first, Marjorie. Let yeah. us proceed. Okay. So, good evening, Chair Benjamin and Commissioners. My name is Marjorie Perlmutter. I'm an architect, land use attorney, former member of Community Board 8M, former commissioner on the Landmarks Preservation Commission, and currently chair of the New York City Board of Standards and Appeals. Thank you for inviting me to our, participate in this panel discussion tonight. Um, the BSA was created in 1916 to protect the city from challenges that the zoning resolution unconstitutionally deprives persons of their private property rights without just compensation. You will see in the packet that I provided to you, it's this, um, a timeline of the composition of the board since 1916. This shows that the board has always been comprised of between three and six commissioners with requirements for architects and engineers. In 1975, an urban planner was added. BSA commissioners have been full-time since 1936. BSA is the sole city land use agency with an entirely full-time commission. It's the, the chart is kind of this more colorful one on about page four. Um, my fellow commissioners are a city planner and a structural engineer, both from Queens, a financial feasibility analyst from the Bronx, and an attorney from Staten Island. I am from Manhattan. Two of our commissioners served on their community boards. This representation by all five of these professional disciplines, combined with community awareness, is essential to the board's ability to review and comment on the complex materials presented <coughs> to it by applicants, professional consultants, and to be responsive to challengers. With a supportive staff of only 19, the board hears applications for variances of the zoning resolution, 80 different special permits designated by the zoning resolution, renewals of these permits, interpretive appeals to resolve conflicts about the meaning of specific text in the zoning resolution, DOB or FDNY request to revoke or modify certificates of occupancy, vested rights, request to vary New York State laws governing unmapped streets and multiple dwellings, and others. Variances represent only 11% of BSA's total applications annually. Um, the package actually includes a more detailed description of BSA's authority and the balance of applications. The BSA's prioritization of transparency is evident in its operations. Applications for variances and special permits are required per the BSA's rules to be submitted to the applicable community board, city council member, borough president, president, the departments of city planning and buildings at the same time as they are filed initially with the BSA. All applications upon filing are assigned to a planner, uh, it's not too much longer, who ensures that materials are complete and undergoing seeker review prior to scheduling them for public hearing. Commissioners then independently review all materials submitted on each application and discuss its merits at executive sessions and public hearings. At the public hearings, the commissioners hear and discuss testimony from the applicant, community, interested agencies, and elected officials. All of these sessions are, and hearings are posted to YouTube, a link to one of which is actually provided in your package. Um, commissioners, not agency staff, lead the review, project modification, and resolution of these applications. It is an extremely transparent and iterative process. To ensure independence and transparency, BSA commissioners are prohibited from speaking to anyone outside of the agency about any pending applications. The long this long-standing policy will shortly be formalized by an amendment to our rules with a public hearing under CAPA scheduled for April 11th. 
an increase in the number of BSA commissioners, presumably all but the chair being part-time as they are at other agencies, will reduce transparency by forcing a much increased staff to take on the iterative review process prior to hearing and advising part-time commissioners on the merits of each application. Pursuant to statute and to court directions over the decades, the Board's written final determinations must perforce describe the facts the Board considered in making its determination under a substantial evidence standard and to explain its rationale in detail. All Board decisions are appealable and often are appealed to the New York State Supreme Court in an Article 78 proceeding. A sample resolution and uh, actually a court case is included in your package. As to your questions about the Board's consistency in its review, we have very specific application standards and review each case according its, t its particular facts and circumstances. So I would like the Commission to provide more information as to what it would like me to, to respond to. And I thank you for inviting me to participate in this panel. Thank you. Um, Mr. Tausig. Good evening, Commissioners. My name is Gabriel Tausig. I was an attorney with the New York City Law Department for 39 years, the last 29 of those years, as head of the Administrative Law Division. Among its responsibilities, the division represents the BSA in cases brought against it. As I understand it, one of the matters being considered by you concerns the makeup of the BSA. As you know, the current charter provisions addressing that issue requires that the board consist of at least one architect, one planner, and one licensed and professional engineer, each with at least 10 years' experience. My comment in this regard relates to the importance of maintaining a board with a strong presence of professional experts. The New York State Court of Appeals has on several occasions recognized that the BSA is comprised of experts in land use and planning <clears throat> and has accord accordingly given deference to the board's interpretation of the zoning resolution, so long as that interpretation is neither irrational, unreasonable, nor inconsistent with the governing statute. In light of the often technical nature of the matters brought before the BSA, I think it advisable that any proposal to change the size and or makeup of the board take into account the importance of maintaining a board which has a significant presence of commissioners who have the relevant professional expertise and experience. It, has also be, it is also being proposed that determinations by the BSA be appealable to the City Council. A precedent for such an appeal was established by a charter amendment adopted in 1975 when the Board of Estimate was empowered to review certain determinations of the BSA. That procedure was, of course, eliminated when, in 1989, it was determined that the makeup of the Board of Estimate was unconstitutional. At the risk of being somewhat wonky, I would like to describe that appeal process because I think it might prove helpful in your consideration of the matter before you. The procedure called for the Board of Estimate to initially determine within 30 days whether it would accept jurisdiction of an appeal. The Board was not required to and did not consider all appeals sub submitted to it. If an appeal was accepted by the Board of Estimate, the Charter required that the Board resolve that appeal within 30 days and limited its role to determining whether the decision of the BSA was supported by substantial evidence. It should be emphasized that the BSA does not have unfettered discretion whether to grant a variance or special permit. Rather, it can only do so after it issues findings that evidence was submitted to support the requirements specified in the zoning resolution. In line with that, the 1975 charter provisions did not give the Board of Estimate discretion to make its own de novo determination in considering appeals from the BSA. Rather, it limited the board to deciding whether the BSA's decision was supported by substantial evidence with respect to each of the findings required by the zoning resolution. If this commission decides to, um, decides to propose that the adoption of an appeal process, I think that this precedent can prove helpful in creating a procedure that is approximately appropriately limited and focused in its scope. Thank you. Thank you, Gabe. Menashe? The red light, the red light, the red light, light is on, the mic is on. Okay. <clears throat> Good evening, Chair. You need to is, move it over, though, closer to you. Is the light on? It's not on. The light is not on. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Good evening, Chair Benjamin and members of the Charter 
Revision Commission. I am Inakshi Srinivasan, and I want to thank you for inviting me to participate in this comprehensive, rigorous, and may I say daunting process to consider reforms to the New York City Charter. I'm here to testify and answer any questions on the Board of Standards and Appeals. I'm a senior land use and zoning advisor in the land use practice of Kramer Levin, Natalis, and Frankel. However, I'm here representing myself. I'm a former chair of the BSA, appointed by then Mayor Bloomberg in 2004, and I served in that position until July 2014. While I support the goals of your commission to improve accountability and transparency, I would urge the commission to resist the pressure to make revisions where they're not critically needed and where there are more appropriate ways to implement such revisions, for example, th uh, examples such as changes to agency policy, rules or legislation. Some of the suggestions for reform stem from the dissatisfaction with the BSA's fundamental authority to waive the zoning resolution or with specific decisions that may be in conflict with community sentiment. And therefore, there's a perceived need to change the composition of the board to include representation from elected officials or to allow the city council to function in appellate nature to review and overturn unpopular BSA decisions. I believe that neither should be included in the commission's revisions. First, the BSA is an independent body with experts, and that independence should be respected and protected. The board is made up of five commissioners with set six-year terms. The charter mandates high levels of expertise, requiring the board to be composed of a city planner, an architect, and engineer, all with at least 10 years of experience, as well as multi-borough or citywide perspective. Commissioners must reside in one of the five boroughs, and no more than two members in one borough. Commissioners are barred from any ex parte communication on pending applications, which was strictly held while I chaired the board and is being formalized through rules by the agency right now. The composition and associated charter mandates ensure that the board has the independence and expertise required and the geographic knowledge necessary to make decisions that are sound and impartial. While commissioners are appointed by the mayor, all appointments, including the chair, must be approved by the city council. The commissioners are protected by their term, which extend or cross different administrations. Unlike city planning commission, where elected official representation is appropriate, the board is not a policy-making or quasi-legislative body, but instead it plays an administrative and quasi-judicial role. This system is well considered and safeguards the board's independence and ensures that it functions outside of political considerations. Second, the BSA's decision should be final and should not be subject to the City Council oversight. Its decisions are based on evidence and analysis. I've just got a few more comments. Yes, go ahead. That support findings as well as legal precedents and case law. The Board's authority comes with various laws and codes, including the zoning resolution, the building code, the general city law, and the multiple dwelling law. Further, the BSA was created to provide a venue for relief for property owners from zoning regulations, and in doing so, protect the zoning resolution from constitutional challenge. In this context, it would appear to be in conflict to designate the legislative body that enacts the zoning resolution to oversee the board's decision to waive the zoning resolution. In 1989, the Charter of Reform carefully established the role of the City Council in the city's land use apparatus and purposely did not replace the Board of Estimate review of BSA decisions with the Council. I believe there's no basis now to disturb or change that process prescribed in the Charter. And finally, the BSA should have the discretion to determine timeframes for its public hearings. Such discretion safeguards a more deliberate, transparent, and fair review that responds to the complexity, the quality of evidence, um, the quality, and the level of support and opposition in each individual case. Anything less would undermine the Board's ability to make rigorous and rational decisions and could create procedural inefficiencies by forcing the Board to take untimely decisions or not take action or for applicants to withdraw, resubmit a new application, and commence the process again. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, the first questioner is Carl, then Satish, and then... Steve um, and Gail. It's a question to Mr. Tausig. And in the, Jim. Um, back in the old days, when the Board of Estimate uh, did review BSA um, decisions, and as you say, they were not de novo reviews, but simply whether the BSA had uh, sufficient a sufficient basis for their findings. Substantial evidence. Substantial evidence. My assumption is that um, 
disappointed litigants could appeal an Article 78 from the Board of Estimate as well. And, they? And, and they did. And they did. So, so wasn't the Board of Estimate merely a, in a sense, an interim and unnecessary step uh, for disappointed litigants? Uh, disappointed litigants who were unhappy with the original BSA mm -hmm. decision. I think at the time it was perceived as a less burdensome way for a neighbor, if you will, to air their grievance rather than go through the more, if you will, costly process of hiring a lawyer and going to court in the hope that that would resolve it. Um, but you're right. That Board of Estimate decision was, an, off, was often the subject of an Article 78 proceeding. So, and you as uh, head of the Administrative Law Division in the Law Department would defend the BSA both at the Board of Estimate and then again in an Article 78 if it was brought? No. The, when it came to the Board of Estimate, the BSA counsel, to the extent the BSA was called to explain their position would, would articulate that. Um, we represented the city, if you will, in that sense, and the Board of Estimate being the higher level would then be representing the Board of Estimate. But in a sense, this process just extended uh, the time before a final decision would be that's, yes, rendered. But, but that's one, one of the reasons, I think, that the yes. 75 Charter had the 30-day time limits for the Board of Estimate to run. Thank Carl, you. can I add something in response to your question? Can I respond to your question also? Sure. <laughs> Madam Chair, who would, um, <laughs> who would object? In the 1975 Charter revision, um, the Commission expressly decided to change who had to go to court. That was the purpose of giving the Council, of giving the Board of Estimate the appeal, that instead of if the community was unhappy or felt that the decision that BSA had rendered was unjust. Uh, it was thought that it was harder for the community, as Gabe said, to gather the resources to take out an Article 78. So the thinking then was it would change who had to take the, 70, the Article 78, the guy with the big pockets who wanted to develop, or the community. I mean, it was a pretty political Calculation. I, I would note that the appeal to the Board of Estimate wasn't required. In some instances in administrative law, you have to exhaust administrative remedies before going to court. This was not one of them. Satish? My question is Okay. Steve? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for being here. Each of you were very um, concise and clear in your remarks, uh, and thank you for the supporting material. Very helpful. Uh, there's been um, a suggestion made over the years that borough presidents be given uh, a point of authority, uh, one appointee each, the argument being that that would provide for a greater diversity in viewpoints and at the same time uh, bring to the board a greater appreciation for borough, uh, specific borough interests. Each of you articulated your position. How would you defend against the argument that I just made, that it provides for uh, a borough perspective? So the charter already requires that there be no more than two members from any given borough. So at the moment, four boroughs are represented and are oddly, the board has had difficulty finding representatives from Brooklyn. So it's apparently not had a Brooklyn representative, I don't know, in 12 years or something like that. It's quite strange. Um, and in terms of this same issue, because you must have three professionals, then you would have to decide which borough president appoints which professional. And for example, we just had to search for an engineer. We searched all over the city for the engineer, and we had the luxury of being able to duplicate a borough, and it was extremely difficult to find an engineer, and so the idea that, say, one borough president is assigned the engineer, maybe you don't 
find one. And actually, um, I recently had a conversation with one of the borough presidents who was looking to appoint on the city, count, on city planning commission, who asked my advice about someone who was an architect or an engineer in the borough, in the borough of that borough president. And it was incredibly difficult to find a person. And don't forget, these are full-time positions. So you're, you're talking about either somebody who works in city government, which is maybe one kind of easier source, but not so easy. And then the other is that you're looking for expertise outside the city. And um, in certain of these professions, expertise from outside the city is extremely desirable because what comes before the BSA is a professional community of lawyers who are both land use, litigators, incredibly professional engineers, so the top, top of the line, top of the line architects and, his, and different types and financial consultants. And so they're making arguments to the board. And so you need the top level of expertise to be able to respond to those arguments. So I think that um, there would need to be something worked out so that there's a sort of a free reign to, to take a look at those ex levels of expertise. It's, it would be tricky, very hard as it is. And when you talk about these professionals, you have to realize that if and when these people end their city career, they're going to be subject to the constraints imposed upon all city employees who, live empl who, who leave the city. And if they want to go back to their practice, well, they may not be able to, at least for some years. Um, uh, I just want to uh, reiterate what um, Commissioner Chair Perlmutter has said, which is that the composition requires uh, um, uh, uh, commissioners to be uh, representing different boroughs with no more than two within one borough. Um, I think that, along with the fact that the charter and um, the administrative code and wherever, you, even maybe the zoning resolution, talks about uh, commissioners and the need for them to visit, do site visits. I don't think I've seen that in other kinds of um, uh, charter mandates for different bodies that work at a citywide level. And so I think that was purposeful, that in fact, it's not the borough perspective, it's being able to understand the geography and understand how a particular project, let's say a variance, affects that area. And um, so I think that coupled with the fact that they are, uh, have professional qualifications are the kind of, is the kind of expertise that's required to make the kind of decisions that, ha that they have to make and the kind of findings that they have to make. And I just want to add one other thing. In the current makeup, you can't know about every makeup, as I said, two of the commissioners were on their community board, so already show an extreme interest in their communities. One of them was very involved in sort of civic and political issues in his borough. So I, I would say and that all of them are very, very aware of the things that are going on in their own neighborhoods, right? So, you know, because you can only know so much about your entire borough. Uh, and the rest they learn from site visits, listening to community board and community testimony at the various hearings. Thank you. All. You, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Oops. Jim? Thank you all. My question is about the standard that the BSA uses. Uh, you know, the, it, my understanding is the law says that they, I, think, I believe it's substantial evidence, but then it sort of opens it up to, or their own experience, uh, you know, that, that in other words, that that evidence can come from anywhere. Why isn't it incumbent on the person seeking the variance to present substantial evidence to convince the commissioners. Okay, so the zoning resolution, which is sort of what the BSA does for a living, which is read the zoning resolution, is often not so well written. But the, so like the, the substantial evidence standard, which is a part of what's required to be made for a variance, and again, only 11% of our filings our variances, and I want to go through that a little bit more. So everyone, when they think of the BSA, they think of variances. It's a tiny bit of what we actually do. And of the 11%, you'll see a statistic 
the statistics in your folder. Um, I think we had um, 13, 12 applications in the last fiscal year that required financial analyses, so that's the first. The vast majority of our variances are little homes, one to three family homes where no financial analysis is done. Um, very, very many of them are um, community facilities where there is no financial analysis. They base it on a programmatic needs analysis, and that's for museums and hospitals and houses of worship and so on. Um, and so that the concern that everything is about financials, for one, is, is actually misplaced. Um, the other aspect of variance is that the vast majority of the ones that we renew, because some variances come up for renewal, were variances granted in the 1930s the 1950s, and those uses are like gas stations, automotive repair, and things like that, little mom and pop shops that just have to come back every 10 years to the board for a renewal where the board just looks to see if the variance should still be maintained. So that, just to put that in st into perspective, in terms of substantial evidence, the board must make findings. The findings are all listed as part of the standard for a variance. And um, it is incumbent upon the applicant to present to the board proof that the site is unique, proof that the site is suffering a hardship as a result of its uniqueness. And if it can prove those things, then what is the financial ramification? So it submits all kinds of um, effectively appraisals, for lack of a better word, their financial uh, analyses. And then after it's made, if the board is persuaded that it's made that sort of three criteria aspect, then it moves on to whether neighborhood character, whether the project fits with a neighborhood character, whether the variance is too grand and can be reduced. Um, and all of those play into each other. And when we don't do that, and when the sort of the, the challenger, whoever that is, if it's the applicant who's dissatisfied with our decision or if it's neighborhood opposition, when they challenge us in an Article 78, the first thing the court does is look at whether we looked at all of the evidence. And even in the case of not variances, we often do, in, for example, interpretive appeals, um, so looking at the meaning of the zoning resolution. When the court sees that we or perceives that we have not looked at all of the evidence or didn't give the evidence it sees before it appropriate weight, it reprimands us and it sends it right back for us to look again. So, um, so the courts are, if, if, if the zoning resolution is unclear, the courts are extremely clear. When they send it back, they scold us. <laughs> and opponents will submit their own evidence and then it's for the board to decide. And, and you can have substantial evidence on both sides. Substantial evidence is not an on-off switch. You know, you can have substantial evidence on both sides, and then it's the, for the board to decide which is, if you will, more substantial. No, I guess what concerned me was the part that seemed to open it up to the commissioner's own experiences. And I guess, were you saying that that only comes into place after they do the initial findings, in other words, the hardship, the uniqueness of the site, or? Well, so let's put it, so for example, you, uh, we have experts, right? So the experts come with their own experiences. For example, I'll just use the engineer as our, the, one of our experts who is often dealing with extraordinary expertise in front of him because the best engineers in the whole city come to represent their, their client's case, right? And so he works on his own expertise where he reads the materials and he says, in my experience, this is not a proper analysis of the sub, the geotechnical conditions. So if we didn't allow that back and forth, we would have to defer to the expertise of the applicant, and, and we can't do that. We must rely on our own expertise, and we do the same with all of the other experts that sit on the board. Each one of them pushes back. And then just to pick up on um, um, Commissioner uh, Srinivasan's statement, the, um, the site visits are another part of the board's own experience. So we go to the sites and, and, and then we'll see on the site, wait a minute, the owner claimed that the slope of the site is really extreme. It's only extreme in the left-hand corner underneath the rock. 
So where's the hardship? And if we hadn't visited the site, we would, have to, we would be relying on the text and on bad photographs that are often submitted to us. So we must go in and do that. And sometimes we also have, for example, a, a, a site is in the neighborhood of one of the commissioner's home. So, um, so if the commissioner drives by that site every week and is told by the applicant that there's no parking problem, but the commissioner actually goes to that retail shop all the time and drives around the block looking for parking, then that's, that's evidence, even though it's not, um, let's say, data provided by the traffic engineer, but the traffic engineer provides data which is then refuted by actual in the field experience, right? So to pretend that you don't live in the neighborhood wouldn't be logical. Right, and I, I would just add that these kind of discussions, whether they're um, talking about their own uh, experience in the field or uh, when they've gone for site visits and their impressions, they're discussed at um, a public forum, a public meeting, at uh, executive session, and it, from that, questions may flow at a public hearing. And so I think this is all entered into the record, and in fact, uh, the applicant has an opportunity to refute that or say, well, we've got some additional information to give you and uh, persuade uh, the, the, the board that, in fact, uh, what their experience is, as what their impressions are, uh, uh, may not be correct. And uh, on the other hand, you have, um, you have members of the community who come out and also speak to those issues. So I think... Uh, I don't think you want to bind the, the, the board in a way that they cannot, you can't put them in a box that way in terms of substantial evidence means only these things. And I think that like any board, they should have the ability to draw from their experience. They've been, you know, they're experts. And to ask them not to use their brain or in, in thinking about something um, and bringing that to the table, I think, would be too rigid. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just had a question, well, actually several, but since the Charter already clearly thought it was important that there be borough representation on BSA, um, I understand your point of the practical difficulties of deciding who would appoint which expert, but since the terms are staggered, mm -mm. well, no, they're we, not staggered. You're all up at the same date. Even well, it depends on. So, for instance, when I was appointed, everyone was a holdover. Right. So everyone was appointed at the same time, and their terms ran. Weren't the ones who's, who were appointed, reappointed, their terms ran concurrently. Weren't they just reappointed for the unfilled terms? They were appointed for the unfilled terms, but some of them, it's not particularly staggered because you could also not control when a commissioner leaves, right? So right. some retire off, some just life goes on, and so on. So you can't really control the staggering. So this is that that's the problem. For instance, when I came on, there was a huge vacancy, right? And it took a year to find a, an engineer. And so we were, it, we cannot exist without an engineer. We actually had to um, delay accepting filings of any applications that had to do with engineering subterranean conditions. That means any um, for-profit application had to be held off. But would you agree it is possible that a borough president could appoint and could do the same search you're doing? Uh, if they had an appointment department that does that wide search. I mean, you have to realize what it entailed. I mean, I had about I had only five people who were interested in the position of engineer, and only two were qualified, and one was from Georgia. <laughs> so um, so it, it was actually a major dilemma, because don't forget, these are full-time positions for a professional engineer 
who makes a lot more money working in one of the large engineering firms. And it's not a great idea if you get someone necessarily who's retired because you don't know how long the person has been out of practice. Right, and but you they need might them no, but and you need them to know how to do the analyses, right? And science is how it is and computer programs and all that. So you have to be careful what you wish for there. Um, I agree, but yeah. it is possible <laughs> that a, there could be a scheme where there was more, the borough representation was appointed or recommended by a borough president. So that's one of those things where careful if it ain't broke. Um, what what is it that you're actually trying? What I'm asking of, you the question. No, Andre. no, no. I'm not. I'm, I'm, but that's what I'm. That's my answer is. I'm not sure how you accomplish what's already a very difficult task of finding very skilled professionals to sit in these positions if you're giving it to all the different borough presidents, and each one has to figure out how they're going to do this borough-wide search, because presumably they want someone from their borough, right? And how they accomplish actually finding somebody when we looked all over Brooklyn right. and found no one to fit in two slots, two Who different wanted slots. To. But I, no, I'm no, not no. arguing two, that two you slots. don't do a great job at finding people. That's not my argument. I think you do do a good job. But this issue has come up, and I think saying that it's too difficult for the borough presidents is not an answer that works for me. Right. Okay. I, but I do think that one ha has to ask the question as to what are we what trying, are trying to achieve here. Yes. And I think that there is representation. And, you know, if you look at the workload of the board, first of all, it changes over over periods, right? It's not always, it's not static. So when I was the chair, it was all about vested rights. That was it, the Bloomberg administration, yes. a lot of down zonings. Now it's something else. They were all in certain boroughs, um, and that was a particular situation. The variances in the Bronx are very few. Um, the, what's called a, a special order calendar is, or the A cases are also, they're, you know, they're, a lot of them are Manhattan based uh, because it's not surprising it has the highest real estate and very controversial um, you know, projects and uh, resourceful communities who can combat them. So uh, I think that I really do believe that one should give some deference to the fact that you have professionals who are from all these boroughs, and it's not always three boroughs, it's, it changes as well, and they were meant to, to satisfy, I think, that idea of understanding the city geographically and its different communities. Mm -hmm. And um, the other thing is that uh, I think we have to understand that the process allows for public input from community boards. It's, they get 60 days, uh, similar to ULAB. And uh, so I think the commissioners are able to understand the implications or variances of the applications in those neighborhoods. Right, and just to add again, I'm not sure kind of what the difference is in terms of the ultimate outcome. To this point, first of all, there's someone from every borough, ideally. Um, we have four boroughs represented. Um, but the other is that it's not as if the borough president can ever speak to the commissioner I about a pending application. So you're not going to get any influence from that appointer. I agree. Okay, so, you know, Therefore, I don't actually understand the ill that's trying to be cured. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Thank you very much. I hope we can Thank call you. on you also. Um, as if there are additional questions or proposals that come in to let us know your opinions of them and how they would work in re real day practice. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. I'm on the next one, so I'll see you. Okay. Yeah, so good see you. Oops, my microphone is breaking down. No, I'll take that. Um. Oh, 
Lovely. <laughs> Our last panel, which is seated here, is on Landmarks Preservation Commission, and we have quite a distinguished panel. We are joined by Peg Breen and Lisa Kersovich. Have I pronounced it Kersavage. right or screwed it up? <laughs> Kurt Excuse me? Oh, Kersavage. It was very close. Kersavage. Um, and we are rejoined by Menashe and Marjorie, who both served at the Landmarks Commission in addition to serving at BSA, although at different times. And we also have Mark Silverman, who is the counsel to the Landmarks Commission, and who will not be making a statement but may well be answering questions. Uh, Bob, where are you? Ah, a former... Would you like to answer questions, too? Please feel free. <laughs> Who is a former chair of the Landmarks Preservation Commission? <laughs> what? Yeah. Oh, wait, it's here. Thanks. Um, There's a lot of place here. Lisa? May I ask you to start, and then we can proceed to Lisa Menashe Peg. Thank you. I'm Lisa Kersavage, and I am here reading a testimony for Chair Sarah Carroll, who was um, ill and was very sad she can't make it tonight. Thank you, Chair Benjamin and members of the Charter Commission, for the opportunity to testify tonight. Under the city's landmarks law, authorized by the Charter, the Commission has designated more than 36,000 architecturally, historically, and culturally significant buildings and sites, and protects them by regulating proposed work. The city's law was the subject of a landmark Supreme Court case, Penn Central versus the City of New York, which established the constitutionality of historic preservation itself. Consequently, it is the model for countless other municipal preservation laws around the country and even internationally. This year, preservation leaders from across the globe, from Tunisia to Singapore, have come to visit and learn from LPC, the largest preservation agency in the United States. The commission is composed of 11 commissioners and supported by a staff of about 80. Each year, we designate individual buildings and historic districts throughout the city. This effort involves holding public hearings and working with property owners, elected officials, community members, and other stakeholders. Once designated, we work closely with property and business owners on a daily basis, host weekly public hearings, and review over 14,000 applications for work annually. Between 93 to 96% of the applications are approved by staff pursuant to LPC's rules. The remainder are referred to the relevant community board prior to public hearing before the commissioners. Commission-level applications may range from changing the color of a building's facade or installing a new storefront to the construction of a major addition or new building. The law works well. We designate and regulate in an open and transparent process. The drafters of the Charter recognize the need for an independent, diverse, and expert commission. The 11-member commission is required to have at least three architects, a historian, a planner, or landscape architect, and a realtor, as well as a representative from each borough. With the exception of the chair, all of the commissioners are volunteers. In addition to meeting all of the statutory expert requirements, four of the current commissioners have significant experience in historic preservation in their professional lives. All commissioners are appointed by the mayor for staggered three-year terms with the advice and consent of the council. Having the mayor appoint all of the commissioners results in a truly expert body where individuals have allegiance only to the institution. This impartial and expert approach is on view every hearing and meeting day. Regarding expanding the Commission's membership um, and who nominates commissioners, I want to emphasize that it is critical to our preservation mandate that we have objective, independent, and expert members. The current composition ensures that our com commissioners are independent experts from across the city. I have concerns that these proposals could impact the Commission's ability to reach consensus and affect the ability of property owners to get a fair and efficient review of their applications. There will be great harm done to preservation if the quality of the Commission becomes diluted, if the size of the Commission becomes cumbersome, or if the Commission cannot make decisions in a timely manner. Finally, I note that it is unclear what qualifications the new members would or should have and which appointing body would be responsible for appointing which experts. And I just have a little bit more. Okay. 
In closing, it bears emphasis that the Commission, as constituted today, works very well. Significant buildings and areas are designated, and proposed work is efficiently reviewed and potentially approved. We want New York's property and business owners to feel pride in their special buildings. We don't want them to feel that preservation and LPC regulation is just an added burden. It is critical that we review applications for work in an efficient and fair manner. This is not only good government, but it is essential if historic preservation is, con is going to continue to have broad support in our city. I welcome the opportunity to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Manashi? Good evening, Chair Benjamin and members of the Charter Revision Commission. I'm Inakshi Srinivas, and I want to thank you for inviting me to participate in this discussion on revisions to the City Charter with regards to the Landmarks Preservation Commission. I'm a senior land use and zoning advisor in the land use practice of Kramer, Levin, Neftalis, and Frankel. However, I'm here as a private citizen. I'm the former chair of the Landmarks Preservation Commission, appointed by Mayor Bill de Blasio in 2014 and serving till June 2018. Under my tenure, LPC instituted several reforms and initiatives, including addressing a backlog of calendar properties and advancing outstanding designations to fruition, designating historic resources along side major planning efforts, applying more rigorous analysis and committing to reasonable time frames in the designation process, and leveraging technology and data to provide greater transparency and accessibility to the Commission's work. 2015 marked 50 years of the Landmarks Law and LPC. Since it was adopted, the city has flourished with over 36,000 designated properties. The vast majority of property owners keep their sites uh, uh, in good condition and follow the landmarks law. The agency has been effective in addressing an ever-growing workload of applications through additional staff, internal tracking systems, and LPC rules. And LPC conducts a robust process for public input on commission-level applications. There have been very few hardship cases over the past five decades, and the courts have upheld LPC's authority time and time again. In fact, LPC and the landmarks law work extremely well, setting the standard for municipal agencies all over the country. As I said in my previous testimony, I would urge the Commission to resist any pressure to make revisions where they're not needed. I'd like to comment on a few recommendations as follows. First, the designation process should not be changed. The recommendation to delay designation until the City Council vote would undermine the Commission's ability, if needed, to act swiftly to save significant historic properties from irreparable harm. This is, cent this is central to its mandate to protect and preserve the City's historic architectural and cultural resources. The current designation process ensures fairness by requiring notification to property owners in advance of designation and provides the opportunity for comment and public hearing. The ability for LPC to designate such requirements <clears throat> uh, sorry, to designate after such requirements are fulfilled safeguards structures from inappropriate alterations and demolition. If LPC's vote must be ratified by the City Council, inappropriate work may ensue on such properties between LPC vote and City Council vote, which is up to 120 days. On the reverse, under the current process, if properties are designated and later reversed by the City Council, property owners are not harmed since designation and the applicability of the landmarks law would not compel owners to do work on their properties, nor would it restrict them from doing work, only that it require LPC review. While LPC, I just have a few more points. While LPC rarely acts without considerable discussion with property owners, that discretion should continue to empower the Commission. Second, several recommendations reflect the call for deliberation and balancing of historic preservation with housing, economic development, or resiliency. I would agree that it's legitimate to have a forum to weigh benefits of historic preservation with other citywide goals. However, I would urge the Commission to reject these specific recommendations. The draconian suggestion to transfer landmarks authority to the City Planning Commission should be rejected as it fails to understand LPC's unique, separate, and independent role from the City Planning Commission. As to the need for planning and economic analysis in the context of the landmark designation process, the Charter all already allows the City Planning Commission to hold a public hearing and report to the City Council with respect to the relationship of any designation of the, uh, to the zoning resolution, projected public improvements, and any plans for development growth and improvement or renewal in the area. As the Charter conceived, these considerations are already vested with the City, Plan city Council today. Third, with regards to recommendations 
uh, concerning the Commission's composition. I believe that the current charter mandated uh, composition, which includes three architects, a city planner, landscape architect, or engineer, an historian, and a real estate professional, provide the professional expertise necessary to review LPC applications. This composition establishes the minimum requirements for a commission and allows the remaining commission positions to be filled by other related professionals. Historically, the Commission has always had preservation-minded professionals willing to serve the public. However, I believe that by including more requirements of the Commission's composition would only limit the flexibility and diversity of the body that's been affected over the past five decades. Finally, I would ask the Commission to give consideration to compensation of LPC commissioners. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> At the time it was established as a volunteer commission, the focus of its work centered on landmark and historic district designation. Perhaps the draft has never anticipated that over the next five decades, LPC would grow into the largest municipal preservation department in the country, which receives over 14,000 applications a year and whose jurisdiction continues to expand as it designates additional sites and neighborhoods. While additional staff has addressed the steadily increasing number of applications, the Commission, which reviews 400 application, over 400 applications at the 34 to 36 public hearings a year, is finite and at, and at this point volunteer close to 15 percent of their time to the city. I would ask you to consider parity of the landmarks uh, commissioners with the City Planning Commission who are compensated. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Breen, welcome back. Your mic. Your mic. Oh, yes. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Benjamin and Commissioners. I'm Peg Breen, I'm President of the New York Landmarks Conservancy, a 46-year-old private nonprofit preservation organization. The city's Landmarks Preservation Commission, I agree, is one of the strongest and most effective preservation agencies in the country. That said, there are ways it could be strengthened and improved. We support requiring one or more of the members of the LPC to be trained preservationists. While preservation architects serve on the commission and the current chair has an advanced degree in preservation, this requirement should be codified. When the commission was formed, preservation was a relatively new discipline. It's established now. And a commission devoted to preservation deserves preservation expertise. We agree commission members should receive stipends. We agree that serving on the LPC today requires a considerable amount of time at hearings, on field trips, and in preparation for decision making, much more time than when the Commission was created. Stipends would recognize the important service the Commission members perform. We do not support changing the composition of the LPC to include appointments of other elected officials. The Charter already requires Commission members from each borough, and mayoral control maintains clear accountability. Let me repeat from our earlier testimony. This charter should make clear the LPC has binding authority over city-owned landmarks, including schools. Important landmarks such as Erasmus Hall Academy in Brooklyn and Frederick Law Olmsted's home on Staten Island have suffered substantial deterioration under the neglect of agencies responsible for them. The Commission acts when private owners practice demolition by neglect. It needs to act when the city fails to maintain its landmark properties. And the LPC definitely needs to remain independent. Its mission is distinct from that of the City Planning Commission and equally important. The Conservancy commissioned the first comprehensive study on the economic benefits of preservation in New York City. The database report found that more than $800 million a year is invested annually in New York's historic buildings and that is creating 9,000 local jobs. And tech firms, the fastest growing segment of New York's economy, prefer to locate in older buildings with character, mainly in historic districts. The study shows that the LPC has done its job, but we believe the LPC would even more, be even more successful, continuing as an independent agency with the changes we support today. And I have one digression, because I worked for the city council for five years, and the City Council will never be the agency that the city deserves and that numerous people were talking about earlier unless you do staggered terms. If, you, if you're going to lose 43 council members in one fell swoop every few years, you're never going to have a legislative body that should be the legislative body we deserve. Thank you very much, Ms. Breen. Mr. Tierney? 
I'm here to answer questions. I have nothing to add other than the reason I'm even down here is that I had read that you were taking up some issues relating to Landmarks Commission, and I have a deep commitment to that. Spent more than a decade of my professional life, have great pride in that agency and everything that it's done for the city, and I wanted to be sure that no harm was done, that everyone's been <laughs> saying, and I don't believe harm will be done. And uh, I'm, I don't disagree with anything that's been said, certainly by my successors here, uh, or their representatives, Minakshi and Sarah Carroll. So 100% uh, in agreement with the substantial points that were made, tweak here and there, but nothing at all. Just to pr protect it, keep it going, keep it as strong as it is, and uh, do no harm. Thank you for having, thank you for calling me up and <laughs> happy to uh, show up here quickly, briefly. Marjorie? Yes, um, Marjorie Perlmutter. I'm here actually as the voice of what it's like to be a volunteer commissioner. So I served before um, becoming chair of the BSA. I served for, I think, eight years on the Landmarks Commission as a volunteer and um, under Chair Tierney and under Chair Srinivasan. And, um, and so uh, just to kind of put in perspective for the thought process about um, paying commissioners, I think it's an excellent idea, uh, in part because at the time of serving, I was a partner in a law firm and um, a land use firm. And I was therefore not able to work on any landmarks work while I served on the commission, so it was an enormous blow to my income. And in the interest, and a lot of people do that, actually. Many of the commissioners who come on are professionals in their discipline, and because it's so important for them, they really want to serve on the commission. They're willing to go through all sorts of deprivation, really, um, in order to have that opportunity. And then they're not compensated. I mean, what I remember is that we weren't even allowed to have lunch that cost more than $4. So we never had lunch paid by the city for us. And so <laughs> giving up lots and lots of money and not even getting a free lunch. <laughs> Yeah, we, <laughs> when I was a, a staffer in the council and the controller's office, we couldn't take anything, not a cup of coffee, not a lunch, nothing. So you go to this nice meeting and everybody else has this spread and you're sitting. Uh, the first questioner is Carl. Yes. Um, so I, I'd like to pursue this issue of uh, compensation for commissioners because um, – I think probably all of us find it at least superficially very uh, attractive. But it would subject commissioners to a much more stringent conflict of interest requirement than uh, they currently um, uh, face. And particularly small uh, 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 commissioners who are partners in small practices, which many of the landmarks commissioners are. and. Uh, I am, recall uh, Ms. Perlmutter's uh, testimony a few minutes ago about the challenges of recruiting effective commissioners. Um, uh, and I know many of you have had those challenges as chairs of the Landmarks Commission. How much greater difficult, and I've had that challenge as well as a chair of the City Planning Commission, um, how, how much more difficult would it be to get the, the quality um, commissioners that you seek if, um, if they were subject to the kind of stringent um, conflict rules that um, currently govern other paid positions? Hi, it's Mark Silverman, counsel at the Landmarks Commission. Um, so the, the, that question is, is obviously one that's uh, been raised a number of different times over the years. And, and, and um, just as a preface, I do think that the commission, um, following up on what's been said at the prior panel, there is a, it is difficult to find commissioners willing, able, 
uh, and um, you know to, to serve because of the conflicts uh, issues that, that happen at the commission. Um, but I did um, confirm with the, with the COIB that actually a, a stipend would not change the standard of co- of the conflicts, how the conflicts law is applied to commissioners. It really de- would depend on how much time is spent. It would t- the twenty hour cutoff is really where the more stringent requirements kick in, and the commissioners, at least at this point. Um, aren't, wouldn't be working probably 20 hours a week, so the addition, the stipend wouldn't technically or likely uh, increase over the short term um, their uh, requirements uh, under the conflicts law. So just to be clear, so you're talking more about uh, a daily stipend or a, a pure and stipend than, say, I think it was Ms. Promot or maybe it was Ms. Breen who talked about um, uh, compensating them the way, say, city planning commissioners mm-hmm. are compensated, which is at a very different level. Yeah, I think that was, that was my understanding that what was being considered here as opposed to a, I mean, they, they obviously have a slightly different workload and stuff, yeah. Can I just add to this? So I have trouble imagining that the um, confirmation hearings for a commission, a potential commissioner um, who might be paid under a stipend or whatever other kind of method it would be, would be more extreme than what Chair Tierney and I went through when I was appointed. So I, at the time, was both a lawyer and an architect, and so the preservation community, and I think Ms. Breen will remember this, um, were had a lot of problems with that as being potential conflict, and we've had successive um, other possibilities for um, commissioners that were also thwarted because of their professional roles to work for free. So um, currently what ends up happening is if you're a small business owner, you are asked to do something that's Im- rather impossible by the Conflict of Interest Board, which is to isolate the income that is made by anyone appearing before the land use Um, Landmarks Commission, um, and isolate it away from the business partner who will be serving on the commission. So obviously that doesn't work at all for a sole practitioner, and so that cuts them out entirely. And for a practitioner who has, say, one partner, um, that's a very interesting trick. And to the point of having a preservationist be one of the requirements, all the preservationists work and appear before the Landmarks Commission. So it means that they could not be sole practitioners, they could not be partners in their various firms. Um, And so, again, it's one of those things where, other than a retired person, I'm not actually sure how that would work. But um, I think that already the amount of recusals that, for example, I had to go through, and Mark and I often talked about this, I would find out right there at the hearing table that my client is a partner in an application, and I wasn't aware until the client stood up and said something, the applicant stood up and said something, then I'm texting Mark, "Uh uh-oh, I have to recuse. So the recusal requirements are enormous already, The vetting process is enormous already. I have trouble imagining it would be worse if they were paid. And I don't know if it means they have to fill out those terrible forms that we have to fill out every year that divulge everything. But people who really want to be commissioners will fill out those forms. Can I just say that when we're talking about preservation backgrounds, yes, professional preservationists, the profession, the Preservation architects are fulfilling that now. Um, And so it's not as if I want to go beyond the commission, but there are plenty of people with preservation backgrounds in various fields um, that could um, ensure that a preservationist is there. I think what we're talking about is is that it should be recognized that it is a profession now, and this is a preservation commission. So that's why we're asking for it. Jim, and then um, Reverend Miller. I was uh, intrigued by uh, Peg's comment on the uh, commission having the authority 
to ensure that the city is maintaining uh, its buildings. And I wanted to ask you, you know, practically how would that work and then ask the other uh, panelists to comment on that. Practically, if it does not do anything except public shaming, which some agencies thoroughly deserve for the way they care for their properties, um, it doesn't. It isn't fair that you know we're asking the public uh, to maintain certain standards, and the commission can sue people if they are committing demolition by neglect. And yet, some of our most valuable landmarks were literally almost at that stage um, because of neglect by the city. And I don't think that's fair. And I think that raising this and trying to make sure that um, agency budgets are sufficient or agency priorities understand what they have to care for is a role that the commission should be should be playing. So if I can just respond, I, I think that um, it, it, as a matter of context, it's important to think about how the law was drafted. And I think that, you know, the, the landmarks law has always uh, recognize that the mandate for preservation is balanced by other governmental mandates, whether it's affordable housing, whether it's criminal justice, whether it's all sorts of different things. And um, so the law uh, in Section 318 has always said that we are advisory. And we've only become binding uh, authority when, in 1997, the Art Commission statute, uh, the charter mandate, was changed to allow us to act in lieu of the Art Commission in certain circumstances where city property is involved. So we do have the ability to act um, uh, to sort of bindingly uh, uh, regulate uh, city-owned property. Um, we do not, as, as Peg points out, there is no authority for us to uh, sue or enjoin another city agency, and I think that would be that would be a highly unusual situation to find ourselves in. Um, I do think, though, that the commission, um, and, and that is not to say that there aren't situations where other agencies have not uh, taken care of their landmarks the way we would prefer. But I think that the they're, though difficult and sometimes prolonged, um, we do work very closely with other city agencies. And I think as a general matter, at the end of the day, um, through, through our working closely with them, through public pressure perhaps, um, these, these resources are, in fact, ultimately fixed up, whether it is a, you know, the uh, farm colony in Seaview in Staten Island or... or the corn an, exchange? Another, or the corn... There, there have been situations, right? But that was, um, you know, um, it doesn't work perfectly. Um, but I do want to just say one thing that, that Peg stressed. I think that um, in thinking about this, um, the reason we can't control, you know, uh, schools and stuff is SCA and other authorities through state law are, are exempt from local landmark regulation. So it's not the, the lack of uh, the local landmarks law that prohibits that. Can't there be informational hearings? Can't you um, point out that uh, Snyder schools are dilapidated in certain instances around the city? I mean, it, it seems to me that if nothing else, you really should use your bully pulpit. And I know that a lot of, a lot of this goes on behind the scenes <clears throat> in, in government, as it properly should most of the time, but when it's not working, um, Valuable buildings are in great disrepair, thanks to um, any number of city agencies, and it isn't right. Thank you. Um, Reverend Miller. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, panel, for your presentation. There. Here. Thank you. So the question is, do, do you feel that um, the LPC is sufficiently staffed enough to hear some of the concerns neighborhood by neighborhood from residents? Um, I think we all can agree that there are pros and cons in everything. So as a pastor of a landmark church, we were proud to partner with uh, landmarks to maintain a stained glass window. At the same time, we hear uh, concerns from some of our community homeowners that it's very difficult to keep up with the standard that LPC sets. Um, so does the staff as is have the capacity enough to hear all of these concerns to maintain those standards? 
Yes, thank you for your question. Um, I mean, we certainly do strive to work very closely with communities and also with the property owners um, of landmark buildings or buildings in historic districts across all five boroughs. Um, I do believe we are adequately staffed to address these issues, um, but you know, it's it's a constant issue for us. Um, I mean, in terms of outreach with communities, um, we work very closely with community boards, with advocacy groups. Um, with elected officials um, on trying to understand um, preservation opportunities, um, places where people want to see designations, um, and, and trying to um, survey and study those uh, properly. In terms of the property owners, um, we are increasing, under Chair um, Sarah Carroll, increasing our outreach efforts. We're doing more and more um, community uh, presentations um, and trying to work more closely with property owners to share um, what it means to be landmarked, what, um, how our regulatory system works, and how to work with us and also um, grant opportunities that we have. Um, but we, I think we do have the staff to do this work um, and we are prioritizing it. So just, just to add on to that, those grants, there are grants, those grants are matching grants, correct? Um, they are matching grants um, under certain circumstances. Um, they are through um, HUD money, so there are criteria in terms of income and certain census tracts where they are eligible. But for the grants to property owners, um, I think they're generally um, not matching grants, right? Oh, sorry, they usually are matching grants. <laughs> May I add? Um, at the Landmarks Conservancy, we have a sacred sites program that's statewide, and we give grants and technical help to landmark religious institutions of all denominations all over the state. We also have a low interest loan program aimed at low and moderate income property owners. And um, we don't just give grant the grant or the loan in either case. Our staff really works with the institution or with the individual homeowners to make sure that their, their work is done with a budget that they can afford. and. Um, on time. And I just want to add that that's invaluable to the city's historic preservation work. Um, Commissioner Faella. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Um, I'd just like to drill down a little bit deeper uh, into the, uh, the stipend issue. Before I do, though, uh, Ms. Breen, I'm very disheartened to hear what you said. Uh, I'm the one who uh, purchased uh, with capital money the Olmstead House. Um, it took me four years here in the council to get them to fund it and to hear that it's in a state of disrepair is very, very disheartening. Um, on the, we're in the, the process of working with the Parks Department and we're raising money to stabilize it ourselves. That's wonderful. Because it's, it would be quicker than yeah. going through a city agency to get the money. Yeah. Thank you for your leadership on that. It's a, an important jewel. Um, on the stipend issue, and, and Chairman Tierney, you may, you may have the, the historical uh, perspective here. Do, do, do you or does anyone on the panel uh, know the, the historical rationale for not providing a stipend uh, to the LPC members? And as a follow-up to that, what would your specific recommendation be? What would we peg it to? What should it look like? If we, if we didn't mandate a stipend. I don't know the history, Mark May, in terms of why there were never stipends and why they were unpaid. I Mark, mean, you... from what I understand, the, the, the drafters saw is twofold. You know, one is they really wanted a, this to not be sort of a patronage position. They didn't want it to be something that people, you know, would make money up. This was really seen as people who cared solely about historic buildings uh, and things that needed to be preserved and protected in New York City. Um, and I also think to a certain extent there was a notion that the workload would not be um, overwhelming. And I think uh, 55 years later, uh, with 36 thousand five hundred buildings designated there's uh, you know and, and as um, uh, chair Srinivasan mentioned you know 36 hearings and meetings a year the workload is definitely increasing but I think that was the uh, that was the sort of rationale back then what's a fair uh, guesstimate or a fair market value for for such a stipend today if it was to be imposed I'm gonna uh, turn that over to people who actually <laughs> serve. <Okay. laughs> so, 
So I would have to say that I cannot see what the difference is between what a landmarks commissioner who's a volunteer does and what a city planning commissioner does. And I have to say that as land use lawyer, Mark and I work very often together on cases where there was an application based on a hardship argument to try to demolish a landmark building. And so there were times I put in 40 hours a week. And so not even for lunch. And so <laughs> so I think it really depends on the Landmarks Commissioner. Um, some really are involved, so they're working much more than just those hours. And when I say just those hours, it's a lot of hours for one each hearing. Some are reviewing materials. Some are going on site visits. Um, so it's a lot more than just that one day, but it's three to four hearings a month, right? So that's a lot, all day. What, what about per diem for that? Well, I, I don't actually know how the per diem works, but there's already an example at city planning, so I don't know why. Just, just to note that, that, that city planning, those commissioners are city employees subject to every single conflict of interest requirement, which is quite different from a stipend. No, but we already talked about conflict of interest. I actually mm -hmm. don't think that would be an issue because we already are. We're. <laughs> I think that where the difference might be, Marjorie, actually, is that at, at some point the firm can no longer appear before the Landmarks Commission. So, and I'm not sure where that, where that line is, whether it's the 20 hours or whether there's a certain amount, but that's, that's the critical thing is the firm would no longer be right. able to appear. But I think that's the key. Let's try to find what the magic cutoff is. Uh, that's, below it. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Paula? Thank you all for being here. Um, several of you mentioned that our uh, Landmarks Commission is considered one of the strongest and most effective in the country. And I was curious, what are the measures that are used to determine that? Um, <laughs> oh, well, I know that, sorry, but I just know that Lisa did a very uh, comprehensive study of, of uh, I think, five cities in, uh, in the U.S. and sort of compared different aspects how big uh, the agency was, how many, uh, I'm gonna let her speak to her findings. Um, I, I have, and actually, um, I did a study of different cities for a foundation in Philadelphia, and then also um, LPCs, um, part of a big cities network, so we're looking at metrics across different cities with preservation. And um, definitely in terms of the size of the staff, um, LPCs the largest in the country, um, in terms of the number of designations, um, in terms of the permits issued um, were the largest by far. But I would say also um, addressing the complexity of preservation. So, I mean, we talked tonight about designation and regulation, but we also really strive to address issues of diversity and, you know, how it relates to, say, culturally significant landmarks, um, sustainability issues, and how our regulations can um, streamline uh, resiliency and sustainability efforts, um, how preservation can fit into um, larger city planning efforts. So those are the kinds of questions when we have other cities um, from the U.S. or from around the world, they're, they're coming to ask us about those. And also some of the issues with enforcement and just our basic operational issues are also of great interest. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, it's also the strength of the landmarks law, too. <laughs> Seeing no other questions, I'd like to thank the panel, both the ones we anticipated and the ones who joined. <laughs> thank you. We thank you. And, and I'd like you. to um, reserve the right also, as people delve further into these topics, to call on any or all of you, again, to help us look through the various proposals and to see how we might address some of the issues that have arisen, um, we'd like to be able to call on you. Sure, and thank you for saving the best for last. <laughs> <laughs> I thank all of you for coming. And um, with that, I would um, like to call our sixth panel. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I'm getting a little punch drunk. This concludes <laughs> This concludes our series of expert forums. I'd like to thank everyone 
who has joined us over the past few weeks for a very informative series of conversations. The Commission staff will continue to process all of the feedback we've received and develop recommendations for us, which will be followed by another set of hearings in all five boroughs later this spring. With that, the business of today's meeting has concluded. Commissioners, while you're more than welcome to take your written materials with you, please remember to leave your blue folders so that, and name cards behind so that we may use them at the next series of meetings. Uh, once again, I thank all of the commissioners for your participation, for your thoughts. Um, and with that, do I have a motion to adjourn? No motion. Boy, that was. <laughs> okay, the motion has been seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? This meeting is adjourned. Not yet. We have your schedules, though, so we. All right, Madam Chair. Okay. Have a good night. You too. Uh, oh. Uh huh. Oh yes. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So in advance. <laughs> Actually, uh, as of today,